Welcome to Six Pack Philosophy, where we take philosophy, mix it with beer, and apply it to the questions you deal with every day. Welcome to Six Pack Philosophy. I'm Anastasia here with Mike and John. And today we're talking about fucking around. Are we talking about fucking around? Actually, we're talking about... about, uh, Isn't that what we do every week? Uh, yes. <laughs> um, actually, what we're talking about is uh, monogamy, polygamy, polyandry. Uh, fucking around. Fucking around. Yeah, yeah, yes. Yeah. Or we fuck around. Isn't that the question? <laughs> um, it's so funny. Our our little intro speech. I imagine it as some sort of salve. We mix philo- or we take philosophy, mix it with beer, and and like apply it. <laughs> <laughs> the problems you deal with every day it's like a salve for that rash that you have by the way <laughs> it's, like, it's like KY jelly you just apply no! it to where you need it rub it in it's like neosporin <laughs> let me speak as the audio guy for just a little bit it does not help you whisper because it still records your audio uh, what is that? well we're doing the intro it's I recording audio we weren't they whispering were, I heard whispers the audio that was ears all in your head. I think up. it was in your okay. ears. Okay. okay. Uh, or if I was whispering, I didn't know I was whispering. How's that? So anyway, what are we drinking, guys? We are drinking the infamous or famous Kentucky Breakfast Stout. A Mine's breakfast all the way over there. stout. A breakfast stout here. This is by the Founders Brewing Company in Grand Rapids, Michigan. And this is an 11.8% ABV. That's basically a wine. This, this, this is basically straight or alcohol. A liqueur. This is basically drinking rubbing alcohol, is what we're no, saying. No, <laughs> this is nothing like drinking ever. 11.8%. Uh, and this is after we recorded another show earlier at a 9.2. Yeah, there's a few things I want to mention about this beer. We usually try and stay off beer advocates before we do this. But this one was so infamous, I actually already had some information. This Look is, at that color. God. This is rated world class by beer advocates. It is a 4.6 on beer advocates. 4.6. It is the number 32 rated beer on the entire site. Oh, I'm excited. Smell it. My God, look at the color. Stick your fucking nose in that stream. It's uh, amazing. Stick your nose in that stream? <laughs> well, and something that... Did you really just say stick your nose in that stream? <clears throat> something that's worth mentioning. Yes. Are we on Pornhub now? What, what are we doing here? No. What, what did this cost us per bottle? $7 a bottle? $8 a bottle. $8 a bottle. And if you're on our YouTube, you'll notice we have three... 12 ounce bottles here. They had a limit. They would only allow us to buy up to a mm. total of three 12 ounce bottles at $8 a pop. This is incredibly limited supply. It is really high rated. It better not be a fucking disappointment. If you've got a chance to get it, go try it, you know? Yes. And this God, is. God, it's so pretty. Shout out to. Uh, Fresh by Brookshire's Brew Club. They're so good to us. They really are. They really, really are. This is one of those beers that's seasonal and people actually rate it against itself by vintage. Yes. Really? Yes. Interesting. Interesting. I haven't even taken a sip of it yet. I'm just sniffing. It smells. You know, that, that's the best way to drink an 11 point, point something it, it percent. It smells like coffee and brandy. Yeah. It, yeah. Yeah. I think that's fair. So I want to I want to go through before we start, and we talked about in our last show a window. What's it called? The Overton, Overton window. window. The Overton window, and I think this is one of those issues where the Overton window is heavily weighted against this. And I think there's a lot of terminology we're going to talk about here that people aren't going to be familiar yeah, with. Yeah, yeah. And so I want to just lay down the even ter- one that I got wrong. Yeah, I want to lay down the terminology here, um, and, and this is. <clears throat> This is really one of those that's important to me because I'm, if you hadn't watched this show before, I'm heavily involved in the Libertarian Party. and Extremely heavily involved. If, if you're on the YouTube, you should admire this beautiful cup and you yeah. can ask us on our comment section and I'll tell you where to get it. But that said, um, the Libertarian Party, since day one, has supported uh, a homosexuals' right to sure, marry. Sure. Uh, has supported the the gender and sexual minority community. Has. And now that's kind of been picked up by some of the main parties, and good, awesome, but there's still more work to do. And one of the places where we differentiate ourselves 
is we are in support of marriage equality in a way that complete pe- complete marriage equality you don't hear about. Yeah. So polyamory is is one of those things that doesn't get talked about enough, <laughs> and. Yeah, um, poly meaning many and amory meaning love. Yes. So I want to go through some of this terminology because I think the, the average person doesn't know. First, so, some that you'll be familiar with. Monogamy. The practice of marrying a single person, marrying once in a lifetime, or marrying with only one person at a time. And on the marrying with only one person at a time, we see that more in, in, in America with divorce. Yeah, yeah. Serial monogamy. Serial monogamy. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, we're, we're not monogamous for life. We're monogamous for now. Yes. Uh, polygamy, the practice of marrying multiple spouses. Yeah, yeah. Um, I will say that there are places where you'll find polygamy defined as when a husband has multiple wives. Uh, uh, I, that, that's where I got this one wrong. Uh, yeah, and, and we're, we're going to say a little bit. There's another word for that. Yeah. I want to talk about a little bit about bigamy. And, and bigamy is is like a subset of polygamy, and isn't it's, that more the legal state? Well, it's marrying multiple people in a state in which you're only allowed to marry one. It's like the okay. illegal act yep, of polygamy. Yeah. Uh, and, and bigamy, by meaning two, and gammy meaning marriage, right? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Next, I want to talk about, and and, and I'm probably words. I'm probably mis mispronouncing this. Polygony. 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 Poly- Polygony. It's polygamy. <laughs> Whichever the word is, it's when it's, a man... It's Greek. You pronounce it as a hard G. It's when a man is married to multiple wives. Polygyny. <laughs> Next is we have polyandry, which is uh, when a woman takes on m- multiple husbands. We have... It's wrong. We have polyamory, which <laughs> is not necessarily marriage, but it's the practice or... And here's the kicker. The practice or desire for intimate relationships with more than one partner with knowledge of all partners. I think there's... I think the important part there is with knowledge of all partners. Yes. Well, yeah, that's the differentiation between cheating. Yes, yes. But I think there are multiple people in, in America who, while they don't, you know, depending on this definition, you know, partake become, becomes a, an ambiguous word. But while they don't practice... I think we've seen sure, where sure. they have desire and absolutely, and, you know, yeah. absolutely, yeah. So then I want to talk about the different types of monogamy. Marital monogamy refers to the phys- the, the marriage, whatever license or registration or whatever that is. Their social monog- monogamy refers to two partners living together, having sex with each other, um, and cooperating. In, acqu- in acquiring basic resources such as shelter, food, and money. But you have to have sex. Yeah. So you could be having sex with other people, but you're only married to a yeah, single yeah, person. Yeah, well, yeah. you don't have to be having sex. You just can't be having sex with other people. No, you no, could no, be. No, it says on here, having sex with each other and cooperating in acquiring basic resources such as shelter, food, and, and money. So you could have something on the side, but you're married to only one person. For social I don't think monogamy? So. I don't think so. But I, 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 that's not the understanding I get of it. Yeah. Okay. Sexual monogamy refers to two partners remaining sexually exclusive with each other and having no outside sex partner. And then genetic m- monogamy refers to sexual sexuality monogamous relationships with genetic evidence of paternity. This more refers to the bastard child. Yeah. Where, yeah. where you had something on the side and you had a child with another person. But, and here's the kicker. The partner, the male, it has to be in this case, um, doesn't know it's not their child. Mm-hmm. They think mm-hmm. it's their child, but they're raising someone else's child. Um, I'm I read gonna th- somewhere that I read somewhere that somewhere around thirty percent of of men in the in the world are raising somebody else's child. That I is, don't know where that number. Believe that. I don't know where that how, how they found that number, but I read that somewhere. I'll talk about that. That's actually false. Really? That, that, that that's way false. And I'll talk about where that came Wait, from. Wait, okay. unknowingly raising. That's someone what it else's? said. That's what it said. Uh, yeah. Unknowingly yeah. raising someone else's child. But uh, I'll just say we we we've, we've defined monogamy. I, think I saw it on the wiki. Yeah. Mm-hmm. We define monogamy in multiple different ways here. We're going to use the term generically and, I guess, apply it to whatever monogamy fits the situation yeah, we're yeah. talking we're about. We're basically saying having sex with one person, right? I don't know. We'll talk about multiple forms of it. Okay, okay. Okay. So, all that said, uh, Anna, we'll be kicking it to you soon. Uh, I want to talk about the biological arguments for monogamy and polygamy. 
um, and I want to talk about it broader than Homo sapiens. I want to talk about just general genetics. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. Um, so what I find to be interesting here is we have seen time and time again arguments that... You're playing our game, drink now. Yes. Uh, arguments that biologically... Um, Individuals should be monogamous. Uh, one man, one woman, uh, coming together to... <laughs> coming together to... Create life. To boink. Coming together to boink. Create life through boinking. Uh, through boinking, yes. <laughs> um, That's the technical term, isn't it? No. Whenever you look it up in the biological uh, 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 I'll say references, this in it says boinking. All of my studies in biology, I have never come across the term boinking. Really? Really? Never, ever. I think that I thought that was the official term. No. I think it's fucking. Fucking, okay. I like yes. boinking. Boinking sounds like fun. <laughs> it, it sounds like the sort of thing, you, it, it sounds like sex in a bouncy house. And, and, and for a $500 donation to Six Pack Philosophy, you, you can, can boink the host in of your... in a bouncy house. You can bunk, <laughs> <laughs> I can't Mike. even say it. So anyway... Um, the arguments have been made on a biological basis that humans should sexually commit to only one other person yeah, yeah. for the purposes of reproduction. Um, it is an argument against homosexuality. Is an, it is an argument against uh, polyamory? Polyamory. It is an argument against promiscuity. Yeah. It's also, in its own right, an argument against asexuality. Yes. Yeah. Um, so. The interesting thing here is we see, first of all, we see in nearly every species of animal that we've studied, um, I am restricting this to animals and not moving to um, rocks, no in boink. insects. Those are it's actually insects uh, are animals. animalia. No. They're not animalia? Yes, they are. Uh, so, anyway, they're just a different class. Or phylum, different phylum. I, I don't know. I, I am referring to animals in the sense of... Particularly mammals. Endoskeletons, not exoskeletons. That's what we're talking <laughs> about. Thank you. So anyway... Um, we're but, not talking about lobsters here. Yeah. yeah. Uh, we're not talking about or things that, um, that reproduce asexually. Yeah, we're yeah, not yeah. talking about... Fair um, enough. Yeah. We're talking about the sexual reproduction yes. organisms. Yes, yes. Okay. Um, so, uh, first of all, the interesting thing here is that we see um, homosexuality in nearly every animal species that we have studied the sexuality of to any extent. Um, it tends to be somewhere around uh, 10% of the population that we observe engaging in homosexual behavior. Ten percent is ho engaged in homosexual in the animal kingdom. Yes, and in the human. Yeah. Well, that's part of the animal kingdom. So yeah. Yeah, but I'm saying yeah. it, it. We don't see a huge divergence in Homo sapiens from mm -hmm. other animals. That surprises me. Yeah. That surprises um, me. Um, now, what I found to I be I don't know why, but it does. What I found to be particularly interesting, that I see to be a, a damning argument against or. or um, against a defined uh, uh, picking which one of these different uh, cooperative relationships that we're talking about um, is in ducks. Uh, one of the things that we have actually observed in numerous species of ducks... Is they have weird penises. <laughs> they do have weird penises. And weird vaginas. And weird vaginas? Yes, because... They match the penis. Yes. I was aware of the penis. I wasn't aware of the vagina. Yeah. Well, and, and that's the thing. That just is, sounds so wrong. You're going to take that out, aren't you? No. <laughs> okay. That's going to be a sound bite. I was oh, yeah. aware of the penis, yeah. but not the vagina. No, no, no. It's not, it's not getting cut out. It's getting... But yes, it is getting <laughs> sound yeah. Um. Uh, so anyway, um, yeah, the, the weird penis matches the weird vagina. It's got a screw to it, doesn't it? Well, not all of them do. Really? They're just... And sometimes they're opposite direction screws. Yeah. So they're just... Diff they're odd. How does that work? No, no, no. I'm yeah. saying one duck will have a right uh, screw and one duck will have a left screw. Yes. How does that work? So Those ducks don't... don't so the speciation... You know? 
Um, the, the separation in species. Poor ducks. One of the ways in which they ensure that they are only reproducing with um, with their species is to um, differentiate themselves. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Is to have a certain design, a different corkscrew. Yes. Yeah. Um, but anyway, <laughs> so ducks sexually uh, ducks will God. try and fuck a human. I mean, yes, we've talked about yes, this other yeah, shows. Yeah. So, so it, it it makes sense to but me. But only that, if they have a corkscrew vagina. It makes sense to me that they would need something specialized because there's nothing in their psyche to tell them not to fuck anything. Yeah, yeah. they'll you know? they they will attempt to repre- reproduce with anything that they are in with Imprinted. the type of. I, I organism knew, they are imprinted to. I knew people like that when I was in high school. I'm just saying. You were people like that when you were in high school. That's true. Yes, I know. That's true. Um, I'd never try. I, I never fucked I a duck. I never fucked a duck. This is a corkscrew. <laughs> um, I think I was a toddler when you were in high school, so I guess I don't know. I've it's just not heard. like I slept with you. I've just heard. Yeah. Uh, but anyway, so ducks I find. Saw the video. Continuing with ducks, I find to be particularly <laughs> interesting um, because one of the things that we've observed in numerous species is a uh, that they will actually change whether they are monogamous, polygamous, or polyandrous depending on the availability of resources. Yeah, um, I think that's true of people. And, There's and a actually, sociological argument we'll get into later on that. Yeah. And I actually wanted to use that to kind of explore that with people. Um, you know, the arguments have been made that after the uh, Paleolithic Revolution, I believe it was. Neolithic. Yeah, the, Neolithic. Neolithic. The, the farming, yeah, yeah, that's farming Neolithic revolution. revolution. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Shift uh, from, from farming. Yeah, yeah. That, that's from hunter-gathered yeah, farming. farming. So with the Neolithic Revolution, um, that... We shifted more to a monogamous. So proud of you for using that word. Thank you. I just got to say, I'm, I am, I'm, I'm having, I'm glowing over here. I'm so proud of you right now. Thank you. Yeah. So anyway, um, that we kind of shifted toward more monogamy, and and what you were seeing there was a change in the availability of our resources. Yes. Um, you're also looking at. Uh, with the Industrial Revolution, we had a, a different shift here. Um, well, I say uh, monogamy. There was more monogamy after the Neolithic Revolution, but we were also seeing more polygamy. Well, there was a lot more um, polygamy in, in a nomadic culture than there was in a settled culture. Mm-hmm. Well, and, and one thing that I've, Still is. I've seen in, as an argument for why we shifted to polygamy, and this goes To past, polygamy or from polygamy? Sorry, from polygamy, and this goes past Homo sapiens, this actually goes into our deeper ancestors, is as we started to evolve larger brains, the increased amount of resources to raise a single child, um, because it requires a lot of food to power a brain. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, actually required more devotion, and and the fact that they had to live longer under their parents required more devotion and resources to getting a child to survive, and it shifted... The dynamic from we need to have a bunch of children to we need to really focus on getting one to live. We need to have one child live long enough to be the heir. And so that's why two people needed to come together and form a household and say, our focus is you don't die. Yeah. And and that was one of the biological arguments for why... This this occurred. That was yeah. my house growing up. Yeah. yeah. Just 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 don't die. Yeah. <laughs> don't die. Yeah. That's just because you were a daredevil. Um, That's true too. But so uh, one of the other elements that we're looking at here is uh, one of the other environmental pressures that we see exhibited on a species that can determine whether it is tending toward uh, polygamy, polyandry, or monogamy is um, genetic diversity. Yeah, yeah. Uh, You know, when you are producing multiple sets of offspring uh, between two specific individuals, those individuals are not continuing to contribute to the genetic diversity of the species. Um, And so when uh, when your numbers are smaller and you're attempting to... Uh, increase the genetic diversity to increase the likelihood of the species to survive and to thrive, you actually want to engage in uh, polygamy in such a way that 
the females are reproducing with multiple males and the males are reproducing with multiple females. That, that's, that's not what I read. I've actually... That's, that's what I've read. Yeah. Uh, go ahead. Go uh, ahead, please. I, I read, I read that, that uh, in, in, in the math... Now, I'm not a mathematician. Mm-hmm. I'm a history teacher. But in the math, that the, 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 the single best thing that a female can do mm-hmm. in order to guarantee that, that, that her... Uh, her DNA continues, mm-hmm. that her progeny can, succeeds, is to find one man that will care for her because she can have one child a year, basically, you know, uh, r- r- roughly. So her her best bet is to find one man that is a great provider and continue to stay pregnant as often as she can in order to create more of her offspring, while for a man, the best thing they can do to get their offspring off is to fuck everything in sight and create as many children as they can, because they can have have, have any number of children uh, in a year. So I've actually heard a genetic argument for two sexual activities that men and women do differently, pretty much universally, and how it plays into genetic diversity. Women during sex, tend to vocalize a lot more than men. And men after sex tend to roll over and go the fuck to sleep. And in fact... You've been watching me again, haven't you? And in fact, the hormones released in the brain after an orgasm in a man uh, make him not desire sex and in extreme cases be disgusted by it. Disgusted by it? Yes. Really? And so they then also get really tired. They roll over and go to sleep. (laughs) So here is the the theory on like the early monkey and where that came from. The man would the male would start having sex with a female. The female would start signaling to the other males that sex was going on, that she is ready for sex. The male would orgasm, he would turn over and go to sleep and about that time the other males would show up and they would all so she knows Bang. she she knows she can only get pregnant once, but she wants the most genetic diversity yeah, possible that makes from sense. it. And the male, he's done his job. He'll be good again, you know, when he wakes up. But he's ready to go to bed. Well, and that's an. I think that's fair. That's. I know I am. Yeah. Yeah. And and that's actually an interesting difference between um, humans and and species that tend to have litters of multiple uh, multiple offspring, because. Um, when a female releases multiple eggs, they can be fertilized by multiple different uh, males. And so that's actually somewhere that I was going, is that um, when you're talking about genetic diversity in species that produce litters, um, you can, over a short period of time, by uh, attempting to reproduce with multiple different genetic specimens... Um, if you, uh, are impregnated by multiple different specimens, you are then producing a wider amount of genetic, genetic diversity, diversity yeah, yeah, at one but, time. Uh, However, with, with I, humans, we tend yeah, I would say to that, only that's have That's true of one animals, offspring. but that's not true of people. Yeah. With people, I, 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 I think there, I think there is a real justification and it makes sense to me, the argument that for women, the best thing they can do to preserve their genes is to have sex with one person and have that person know that that's, that, that, that's his, his project. What if their so genes are incompatible? It. Well, uh, and that happens. But the fact that, that if the man knows that's his child, he is more likely to protect and take care of that child. If you think it's somebody else's child, there's less likelihood of that. It's Go just, ahead. It's just a, it's just a biologic I, fact to me. So the argument that I've actually seen um, for the most uh, the most genetically um, desirable way for women to mate is to become uh, for female humans to mate is to become impregnated by the... She's saying what I'm about to say. The male that is the most uh, the most virulent. Yeah, yeah. And then to um, have that offspring raised by the most nurturing male that she can find. And so not mating and raising a family with 
one male, but mating with one and raising the offspring of that male with the more nurturing male that she can find. Because what it does is it gets you, theoretically, what it gets you is the highest quality genes with the best chance of those offspring reaching maturity. You know, the the, the I, way I've heard it is mate with a high testosterone male and get the low testosterone male to raise it. So I'm going to say this as a stepfather myself. If you're out there as a stepfather, you are the low testosterone male. <laughs> I've got to say, I feel pretty bad here yeah. because I'm, I'm I'm currently raising my godchild right yeah. now that I did not uh, did not give birth yeah. to, and I'm putting more work into that than I ever have in my life. Does that make me a low testosterone male? Maybe at this age you are. Yeah, yeah it's possible. You know? It's possible. It's possible. You know? uh, if you want to give it a shot, give me a call out here, and we'll <laughs> see. Uh, sugar daddy. Yeah, five hundred dollars. Yeah, five hundred dollars. <laughs> That's what it says on the wall. Oh, that, okay. $500, yes. you can sleep with a host. Patreon.com slash sleep with a host. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, it's, six pack philosophy slash sleep with a host. It's not a, it's not a URL. It's not. I don't know, but I really, I really hope somebody decides to do that just to see what happens. Yeah. I will give do you, you the, really want to go to court I will give over you, them suing because they said, because $500, you said they could sleep with you and they didn't get to sleep with you? I, who says they're not going to get to sleep with me? With a host. Uh, a host, yeah. Hey, hey, I will give you the best three minutes of your life. That's all I'm saying. <laughs> Are we done with genetics? <laughs> I think oh. so. Okay, so I want to talk about sociology. I think I, I made Anna blush. That's amazing. I didn't know that was possible. <sighs> so I, I want to talk about sociology, and I want to start with a... When I looked this up, I said... I, I looked at the term, the history of monogamy. Yeah. And this is the result I got back. It's actually changed. If you go look it up now, it's changed, and it's my fault. <laughs> I reported the link as as uh, inaccurate. inaccurate, yes. But I want to read the first Google result yep. I got when I put this in. And this was from Science Illustrated. If you know anything about them, you'll know they are not the best science source. They just have it in the name. But it says, the origin of monogamy... Monogamy evolved in humans when low-ranking males changed tact from competing with the higher-ranked rivals to revealing their more caring side to potential suitors. It developed further by the evolution of female choice and high fidelity. I, I want to clarify real quick here. Um, the high fidelity. Uh, uh, Science Illustrated that was referenced in the... The Google result. Yep. Um, there, there is a more respected uh, Science Illustrated um, in some other countries. This was one that is solely internet based. Um, it's like the and, BuzzFeed of science. Well, and and is is kind of more the. I'm probably gonna get some hate for this, but it's a right wing. Um, apologist, science-based source. Those are podcast air quotes on science. Podcast yes. air quote. We need a sound for that. Yes. We really do. Ding ding. Yeah. Pod- science-based podcast air quotes. Um, source. Um, that that is largely about um, manipulating scientific results to back up some. It's science-based in the same way that that creationism is science-based. Yeah. Uh, yeah. yeah. And so if some of, we are an international show and so some of our listeners may be more familiar with a more respected science illustrated yes, yes. that is not the one that we were referencing there. So I want to I want to I want to tag this a little bit before we get into the actual part of it because I think that there is a large view in America that would back this. First of all, um you know, it talks about low-ranking males and high-ranking males and males became more caring. This is a personal opinion. I'm, I'm going to be scientifically responsible here and say I don't have scientific data to back up what I'm about to say, but this is a philosophical opinion. So if you're listening out there, this is just me. I don't believe humans are that much different over the period of time uh, to be more caring. I think we have different environment we were raised in. I could be wrong. So I'll accept well, that. Would you, would you agree that the environment has made us more caring? I No, no. I, I think we are still equally caring about ourselves. I think the environment is less conducive of violence. 
Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I, I, I can almost accept that. But that's my opinion. It, it's maybe, close enough that I can accept it. Yeah, maybe I'm completely wrong. So let's probably let's go ahead and give them a point. Cool. Yeah. You get a point. I'm just going to say that you're probably completely wrong because this is philosophy yeah, and we're exactly. all probably completely wrong. Yeah. But I want to talk about the, the points where it talks about evolution. It developed further by evolution of female choice. Now, what part of female choice would lead to monogamy? In fact, the, the I heard a really interesting uh, bit while I was studying for the show. Uh, I, I recommend going and listening to him, and I can't remember his name. I'll, I'll put it on the screen. Name, Sam Harris? I don't know his name. This guy was a he, he's he's a gay male. No, that's not him. And I remember him. Yeah, I watched him. Has, has the advice column? Yes. Yeah, yeah. He had an advice column and it started as a joke. He he his friend was about to go yep. into newspaper and he or magazine and he said you need an advice column and and he made this whole joke about I'm going to start a, an advice column in which I chastise people for being straight the same way advice columns have chastised people for being gay and it's going to be a joke. You figured it'd be a six-month joke. Dan Savage. Dan Savage. It'd Savage. be a six-month. I wish six, that was my last name. Savage sexuality or something like that. It's yeah. The name of his, his, but his it'd be show. a six-month joke, and it's gone for years. Twenty-six years now. Yeah. Yeah. Twenty-six. And, yeah. Damn. So, anyway, he he made a really interesting point about the redefinition of marriage for for gay people, and he said, "We, being gay people, didn't redefine that shit." Straight people did whenever you moved it from a property exchange of women into a, a mutual relationship, yeah, and you yeah. allowed us to take over. So I want to ask, what female choice, when they used to be traded, changed monogamy? If, if females can now choose to be with multiple partners or a single partner or whatever they want, why would that push monogamy? That doesn't even make logical sense to me. I think it does if you accept the biologic argument that it is it, it is beneficial for women to have one partner, which is the argument that I've made earlier. Uh, at, at that point, then it would be it would be the choice for them to have one partner. And I but think that's, that's not I, necessarily monogamy. That is being with one partner is not necessarily monogamy. They are only with one partner. Their partner is not necessarily only with them. Well, it's, it's monogamy on one side anyway. Correct. Yes. Yeah. yeah, yeah. That, well, that, that, so, that's so, true. That's true. Yeah. So because you... in the property exchanges, it was not unusual for a man to take on many Multiple wives. wives. Yeah. And, but that goes back to the same biologic argument that the that that the best way for a man to get his progeny out there is to have as many fuck partners as he can. Right. Well, and, and, and so you have to argue that it, in order for female choice to, to drive that, and on top of the fact that uh, it was the, at one time, in some cultures, in many cultures, I'll say, the standard for men to have multiple wives, you then have to accept that the, the wives' choice... Well, but... But the other side of that is that women have a choice who they marry now, and they didn't used to. Their their, their husbands used I to agree. be picked by their mm -hmm. by their fathers. Yeah. Now they have a choice between this, and they choose one man because that is biologically the smart thing to do. Well, but that is not typically how society goes. Society. I think it is typically how society goes. Society tends to swing on a pendulum, where on the one side we have. Uh, uh, polygyny where men are marrying multiple women and and it would be expected you know that what would happen is that when women suddenly have the choice they would uh, rebel to a certain extent and they have to polyandry not to the middle ground of polygamy see I, I think you're defining or maybe the mi you're middle defining that as middle ground and I think that's an extreme ground okay the extreme okay. ground maybe of, you're right. of, of 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 no damn it it's going to be one person because that's what benefits me and 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 the thought that 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 society as a whole throughout society has been uh, polygamous is 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 wrong. It, well, it's, and it's, I, I, it's not true that throughout society that polygamy has been larger than monogamy. Uh, it's been accepted, but it's but even when it was accepted, even in societies where polygamy is accepted, it has been outside of the societal norm. It has not been the regular thing. Generally speaking, 
monogamy has been the rule in, yeah. in, in, in Homo sapiens. Uh, the the other has been the exception. Now, at different, whether it's socially acceptable or not is different. It has been acceptable a lot of times, but it has not been the norm. Well, I was going to say, um, I actually, you've you've swayed me. Um, I agree with what you're saying. I, I maybe reported this in haste. Um, with this caveat, I agree with you on a caveat. I don't agree that the evolutionarily uh, best choice for a woman is uh, monogamy. But if you accept that, I agree with this statement. Does that make sense? Yeah, I agree. I can, I can live with that. Okay. Well, and I, I would argue this, that um, you can argue that a, a woman's best re- reproductive choice is monogamy. However, um, I, I think there's an element that we have to consider and that is the recreational nature of sex. Yeah, yeah. Um, because humans are among a, a few select uh, species that we know of who have sex purely for the pleasure of it. Yeah, that's, that's rare in the animal kingdom. It is. Now, um, we have explored some of the... Uh, Most of the primates do. Some of the ancient Greek philosophy, particularly the bonobos. Yes. Um, <laughs> Lots of sex. The saying, bonobos are the ancient primates, not the ancient Greek philosophers. Sorry, yes. I love saying bonobo. Um, it would but, be a great school of philosophy, wouldn't it? The bonobic school of philosophy. Yes. Uh, but anyway, so... We, we should found that. We talk about... I think we already have. <laughs> um, so we talk about uh, kind of the hierarchy of needs. And at the point at which we shifted from a more uh, polygynous society to a more monogamous society, we saw that um, that our hierarchy of needs was being met in a different way. Yeah. Um, and I would argue that we are actually seeing another shift in the last probably 100 years or so in which our hierarchy of needs are being met even further, and that is the point at which um, we are diverging to a certain extent away from monogamy to not polygyny, not polyandry, not polygamy. hundred years? Yeah. Um, to the Industrial polyamory. revolution? Yeah. Well, and, and, and I want to say... That is actually exactly the point that I would... It's about 150 years, somewhere in there? Yeah. Oh, wow. I, I want to say real quick. We, I think we, you're batshit crazy. I think you're batshit crazy. <laughs> well, you're right. I know. We, we, we kind of excluded bugs. But there's been a recent study that no, needs No, I think to, they're batshit crazy, okay. too. Mm-hmm. There, there's a study that needs to be cited in this episode. Fruit flies apparently like to come. Yeah. So they did a study. I'm a fruit fly. Oh, my God. Yeah. They did a study. They apparently have a way to genetically modify a fruit fly in order to take a nerve and let it be activated by light. They took this nerve that makes them come, and they said, when a red light shines on it, it will activate. So if a red light shines on this fly, it will come. God, I wish I could make that work. So, So, no, not done. Could you imagine how hard that would be with traffic lights? Oh, oh God! God. <laughs> well, the, they made a box for the whole red light district. So um, <laughs> I'd just be driving in the road, coming up, running off the road. It would be terrible. So they took these three types of flies: regular male flies, regular female flies, and genetically modified male flies to come in red light. And they took a uh, an enclosure and put a red light in the corner. And the genetically modified male flies just hung out by the red light. And, and, and they were trying to assess what motivates a fruit fly to breed. And they found out for men, it's ejaculating, right? So the, the point is, you were kind of excluding insects, but this seems to be a pretty universal concept in the sexual breeding yeah, yeah. world. So before members of our audience go off on a tangent bitching about that all of this research money was spent to discover why what it is that motivi- why motivates why flies fuck yes um 
I want to give a... That's a, good money spent, by the yeah, way. Yeah, yeah. I, I want to know. give a certain uh, um, uh, argument for the scientific community and say that particularly with genetic research... Um, as long as it's not government money, I'm all for it. A lot of it is, uh, it is done on fruit flies because they have a short lifespan. They have a short um, a short span of uh, reproduction. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Uh, and they 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 reproduce quickly. They're cheap. They have a short lifespan, and uh, they have a small uh, genome. And they'll Com- they have fuck a, anything. They have a comparatively small genome, and so it is. Uh, it, it is one of the most well elucidated genomes that we have out there and so yes you will see from time to time that seemingly ridiculous research is being done on fruit flies specifically um but there are reasons for that and it is to further the research that we're doing on all on uh other species and extending eventually to yep. humans. That is kind of uh, first base research that that we're doing with fruit flies, and eventually moving on to humans. So uh, don't damn it too quickly. That's right. That's right, John. I don't know if this is where you wanted to get into this, so correct me if I'm wrong. But is this a good time to talk about the ethnographic atlas uh, results here? Yeah, it is. Uh, it is because and, and I found this fascinating. You and I both had this in our notes, and, and I like your chart here as far as it goes. Yeah, so so we we talked about the the societal, so so we're, we're moving into societal cultural arguments for monogamy and polygamy, and this is going to be we we've touched on other species. I think the rest of the show, for the most part, is going to be Homo sapien focused. Homo sapien, yeah, not Homo erectus. No, none yeah. of those guys. <clears throat> So, which by the all. which by the way is my street name, Homo erectus. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> you know, I, that's what they call you, me on the street. You have a street name. I do. I do. I'm Are a, you going to be releasing a rap album soon? I'm, I might. I might. Is it going to uh, be about the same time that uh, Jesus releases his philosophy book? Me and Jesus are going to put it out at the same time. That's right. Jesus. Is that how it is? I, I don't know. I'm, yes. I'm terminally white. I don't know. You are terminally white. <laughs> that is so, true. Uh, so the Ethnographic Atlas, released by the HRAF, and I don't remember what that acronym stands for. Um, talks it's a of, very respective, uh, yes. respected so- uh, our atlas here. Yeah. yeah. What they do is they look at societies. Uh, and, and, and they look at, at things like socioeconomic effects in societies. This is something that, that trained historians and, and sociologists look at all the time. Yeah. So very respected. Yeah. So they have f- uh, four categories here. I, I want to make a note. We are going to be using the term polygenous, which means polygynous, which talks about men having multiple wives, not uh, uh, polygamy, which is generally, we yeah, this talk- is specifically to men. Yeah, and we are going to be using the term polyandry, which is women having multiple husbands. So right. just just to put your your, your and, mind, and, and this is out of one thousand two hundred thirty one different uh, cultures. societies, cultures. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So, I want to hop back to ducks real quick. <laughs> um, it, like real quick though there goes this th- th- this part yeah there is an interesting situation that that happens with a, a few specific specific species of I ducks I think it's interesting that they have corkscrew cocks in which um, when they exhibit polyandry it is that a female typically reproduces with brothers. Yeah, yeah, pretty common. Yes, reproduces with brothers. And so there is a slight genetic uh, predisposition for the brothers to, to uh, see to the maturity of the you know, offspring because while it doesn't have their genetics entirely, it does to a certain extent. Instead of to, half their to, genetics, has a quarter. Yes. To, to tease that, uh, when we get in the religious section, we're going to deal with that with people. Oh, man. So, yeah, yeah, cool. Yeah, yeah. So, uh, we're, again... Ethnographic Sorry. atlas. Gotta Ethnographic atlas, and we're talking about poly... Uh, Jenny, how do, how do you say that? Polyg- polygyny. Polygyny and polyandry. So, mo- monogamous cultures... This is from 1998. Yeah, out of 1,231, they found 186 cultures to be monogamous. Which is pretty small. Yeah. That's what, about 10%? Yeah. 
a little more than 10%? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Polygynous. Uh, sorry, there's two categories here. Occasionally. Poly- Occasionally. So, so, so every now and then you're yeah. going to go out and find some strange. Well, no, and, and I think. <laughs> well, and it's not that. It, it's occasionally males engage yeah, in yeah, it, yeah. but most males don't engage yeah, in yeah, it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's 453. Which is still pretty big. Yeah. Frequently polygynous. 588. So more frequently than, than occasionally. Yeah, yeah. And polyandrous. Four. four. Four, yeah. Pretty small. Yeah. That 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 surprised me. Um, I, but, but I found it interesting how high those numbers were. You know, at, out of all the societies, roughly uh, a little more than 10%. Is that right? Yeah. A little more than 10% are engaging in some form of polyamorous... Uh, uh, of, no, no, no. A little more than 10% are monogamous. Are, are, I'm sorry, are monogamous. Are monogamous. Yeah, and yeah. there's an asterisk here. There's an asterisk here. This does not take into account the relative population of each of the societies studied. So the, the, the ones that have a lot of societies could be two people each, right? Yeah, yeah. Um, and the actual practice of uh, polygamy in a polygamy. tolerant society. Polygamy. P- polygamy, sorry. In a tolerant society may actually Whatever. be low... <laughs> With the majority of aspirant, uh, aspirant, aspirant. That was the word we had to look up. Aspiring is, is I what I didn't it, have to look that up. Yeah, <laughs> of of aspirant polygamist practicing monogamous marriages. I, I got I got a good score on the SAT. I knew aspirant. I did I, I did really well in the math portion. That is eighty five percent math math. It wasn't when I took it. Occasional and frequent polygyny. Yeah. yeah. Uh, p- pretty amazing. Pretty yeah. amazing. I would love to do a hard shot. I would love on to know this one society. What I would love to know is what the U.S. society is. Just I would say probably occasional. Uh, but but I'd like to know what the percentage is because I, oh, yeah, I, yeah, yeah. I I would be fascinated by that. And and here's the problem is is there's a serious reporting problem with any of these things because. Uh, I read this somewhere that, that men tend to overreport their sexual conquests while women tend to underreport them. That's changing a lot more modernly. Well, that's, but, but even changing, it's still pretty significant of difference there yeah. uh, because society accepts it more from males than it does from females. Uh, men, men like to brag about their sexual conquests while women like to try and play them down. Uh, and I think, for we, instance, if I said my number right now, my mother, if she were listening, would probably faint. I don't know my number. I'd have to sit and think about it. So, um, three. Uh, it, I, it's bigger I, than a bread box. Is three. all I'm saying. It's bigger than a bread box. My number is three. Is it really? Yes, yeah, three. 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 One, two, I three. Kept, I kept a diligent list. Three is his number. Yeah, I know that. That's amazing. She's one third. That's amazing. Whoop whoop. I hit. <laughs> I don't know what that was. I hit that number at 14. So, you yeah, know, I'm just in here oh, going, yeah. oh, my God, that's terrible. Yeah. I was trying to remember who the other one was. All right. So I remember now. Yeah. Are, are we ready to move into the religious arguments? No, no, we're not. Um, well, fuck you then. Yeah, exactly. So uh, many societies, and I'm not, this is John Reed time. Okay. Uh, many societies that we consider monogamous, in fact, allow easy divorce. In yeah, many, absolutely. In many Western countries, divorce rates approach 50%. Those who remain, who sorry, those who remarry do so on average three times. Three times, yep. There's citation needed on that, so. I think so. that's average. Yeah, I think it is, too. My I think mother was accurate. married four times. My dad was married three times. So, you know, Holy I look at that. Holy moly. My, my, my parents collected spouses. <laughs> yeah. Was there like a, a trading card game they were I've, trying I've to gotta win? I've got to be honest. My mother was married four times, but the second and third man were the same person. She married him twice. My grandfather married the same. He married three times, but the first and third one were the same. I love my mother to death, but she has she made terrible choices until the last one. He's yeah. fucking awesome. Yeah. But uh, you know, uh, my my father and my my first step, first and second stepfather were pieces of shit. So you know. Wow. So next, I hope Dad's listening. Yeah. You piece of shit. <laughs> <laughs> Next, we have a divorce and remarriage can thus result oh. in what they call serial monogamy, in which your monogamous. I love that term, serial monogamy. That is, it, 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 so it, you can't commit to one person for the rest of your life, but, but you, you can, can commit, commit to, to one person, person for a period of time. Yeah, over I'm going to be monogamous again. for now. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So, which the, is what uh, societies become. I will yeah. say this: I have had numerous monogamous relationships. 
And I have had periods between all of those yep. in which I was in no relationship and definitely not monogamous you to know, anything. But, but, you know, it's not at all uncommon to hear somebody say something like, I'm always monogamous. Yeah. Well, that, 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 that means that you've, you know, you've. You've had a lot of uh, of relationships, but they've you've always had one at a you, time. Yeah, yeah. And I, one at a time. There's a respectable uh, part to that, but the other side is is that really monogamy? Is you kept your word, I guess. You, you know, you said I'm going to be with you. I think you there's and, something respectable about the fact. I think the there's fact, something Calvinistic about it. I'm a Calvinist. So I know, you know you're I'm a okay Calvinist. With that. <laughs> I know that. I'm just uh, saying that purposeful self uh, denial. I don't know that it's all that it's self denial. I mean, I, I, it, I, I it's I, denial of things that you may otherwise want. Okay, I we'll, will agree we'll it's jump. purposeful self denial, but I will also agree that that's not a bad thing necessarily. We I, deny ourselves things all the time. I don't smoke crack. That's my thing. You know. Yeah, yeah. Well, I, I, I try I, really hard not to. Okay. You know? uh, You've never smoked crack. No, right. Me either. You've also never. I've I, also never smoked crack. Nobody here has smoked crack. God damn! What's God damn. wrong with us? We need however, a crack smoker on the show. Ivory Tower. However, <laughs> I have smoked pot. Me too. Yeah. I enjoyed smoking pot, and yeah. I, I yeah. do. Mm-hmm. I do. Pot doesn't do anything for me. Uh, I I do actively deny myself smoking pot. Yeah. Um, I I will totally give you this in the last couple of weeks. I would have really liked a doobie. I, would I have, have not smoked a joint in 20 years. I would have really liked it. Last time Just, I smoked, we were engaged, and before that, I was in high school. Oh, my I'm God, thinking about, and you got okay, no. so paranoid, and it was so annoying, and it harshed my high No, it has so been 23 bad. years since I've yeah. smoked a joint. And the last time I smoked, I got out of the Marine Corps, yeah. and I said, I'm going to smoke one because I, cause I can't. I'm not getting drug <laughs> tested. And I yeah. smoked it and went, what the fuck am I doing? Yeah. And, yeah. I, and I just didn't need it. Like, Same thing. But yeah. I enjoyed pot, but I have said it's not worth it. So I, I practice self-denial, yeah. and I don't yeah. think that's bad. Yeah. Um, and that's the point that I'm getting yeah. to is that were pot to become legal tomorrow, I would probably go and buy a joint, and I would smoke it, and I would enjoy that's it. That's how I feel about cocaine. I would, I, <laughs> I'm just saying. I would not smoke the way I I wouldn't used. smoke pot. But I do cocaine again. I would not smoke the way I used to smoke. So, but I, I, I do practice self denial, and I don't think it's necessarily I'm, a bad thing. I'm going to dispense with this because I don't think the rest is is really important to our conversation. But I want to talk about this. I I, I do want to talk about, and I, I have the numbers here if I can find them. I want to talk about the rate of infidelity uh, among humans, and I can't. I bet it's super high. So I've heard, here's part of the problem with, with finding this number. Is people it's, have to confess to it? Yeah, it's self-reported. Yeah. So I've heard numbers as low as uh, 10 to 20-something percent among females. Yep. And 20-something to about 50 percent of males. I watched a video about this on, on the way up here today. Yeah. And, or listened to it in the car on the way up here. And it said anywhere from 25 percent to 75 percent. And the problem they they gave was, what do you define as infidelity? Because uh, do you define infidelity as uh, uh, actually having sex, or do you define infidelity as emotional cheating, emotional or, cheating, or watching a a, a a Pornhub video, or you know, there's there's all kinds of levels of this that, that that we don't understand. Well, and and I've heard a more modern report, and and let me say this. None of this is peer-reviewed and universally accepted. This is, yeah. like, we hear the controversy on yeah. climate change. This is a real controversy, yeah. right? Yeah, we have no idea. So, but a more modern number I've heard is around 50% among both sexes. Yeah. Yeah, that's probably, I, I, I would just, just on my own understanding of people, I would think that's probably close to accurate. Yeah. But 30 even to if, 50 even if you take that lower to like 30%, right, among the number, it's still really high. It's so, extremely high. So here's the question I ask. It, it's extremely high in a society that... Uh, that values per, monogamy. That seems to claim that monogamy is the only way to go. Yeah. Are in you a society where there's still laws against cheating. Are you still monogamous if you commit to a mono, monogamous relationship if you s- commit to monogamy, if you commit to the societal norm and then cheat, are you monogamous, really? Well, how about, can, can you be monogamous at different times? Can, can you renew your monogamy? 
So here's the interesting thing. I was monogamous thing. until I lapsed, and now I'm going to be monogamous again. Well, and, 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 and I do understand that. But then you get into a weird situation of, you know, I cheat every week. But on the weekdays, I'm monogamous. But, yeah. Yeah, but I ask you for know. forgiveness. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So here was the interesting thing. Um, so my son is 10. Mm-hmm. And from time to... So we, we do the research. Great kid, by the way. I like him a lot. He's really cool good. I love really Sugar cool Jay. Kid. Sugar Jay. Uh, hey, so, I gave him a street name. Know, he stuck with it. I know you did. He's going to have that tattooed on his arm one day. He's going to be Sugar Jay picking I, up hot chicks. How old is he now? Ten. Ten. So two more years. Six more years. Two more years, Six and I get to take years. him out picking two up women. Two more years. At twelve, years. I promised him at twelve I'd take him out to pick up women. I don't give a shit what you promised him. <laughs> the fact of the matter is he what was you about, promised me, and you didn't about promise six me shit. Then. And I said no less than sixteen. Wasn't he about six when I told him I that? Got you. Yeah, no, yeah. you don't. <laughs> God, I've lost my train of thought here. Oh, oh. So uh, it was interesting. So. Um, John, I, and my son live in the same home. And me. so, John, me, and my son live in the same home. We would call that social monogamy. And so, yep. from time to time, um, as John and I are discussing things, or as John or I are discussing upcoming shows with maybe friends of ours on the yep. phone or something like that, um, he'll hear what it is that we're discussing. That's scary. Um We've been really open with him philosophically. I think that's cool. I think this kid is going to be like, well, I'm I'm a little biased, but I think he's going to be the next great philosopher. I think he's going to be on the show one day. Maybe. Um, I just wish he'd come produce once in a while. Yeah. <laughs> but anyway, so it was interesting because John was uh, discussing the show with someone I had spoken to about it previously who had been listening, and he was talking about the shows that we had coming up, and, and he was discussing monogamy and polygamy and everything like that. And I was in the next room over cooking dinner, and Jonah was in the dining room between the two um, setting up a game. And I, I'm sitting there just cooking away, getting dinner ready and everything, and he, out of the blue seemingly, asks me, what's polygamy? <laughs> He's 10. Uh, you're welcome. <laughs> and I'm like... All right, I guess we get to have this conversation. <laughs> yeah, and, yeah. It, and it was interesting because uh, though we haven't, we've attempted not to impress certain social norms and mores on him, um, I could tell that there were certain social norms and mores that had been impressed upon him by other people in society because um, it's not as if he hasn't been interacting with them throughout his life. And so um, the thing that he said was, oh, so polygamy is when there is a man and a woman in a relationship and one of them is cheating. I said, mm, no, not, no, that's not it. And so we got to have a uh, long conversation it's about... It's not cheating if there's an agreement. Exactly. So we got to have a conversation about... Monogamy and polygamy and polyamory. Really wish we had a polygamist on the show. An overarching conversation on consent, which I think was actually we the best part of that We may be doing a hard shot. That would be awesome. That'd be cool. I, I, I need to. Uh, I need to talk to some people. I, I have some friends. Um, Being in the libertarian libertarian party, we actually know a lot of people who are polyamorous. But yeah, um, I, I'll say this: if we do that hard shot, we'll announce it. But uh, depending on people's level of comfort because of societal norms, we may do a hard shot where we can bring someone on the show and discuss things. Yeah. If we don't do a hard shot with that person, I actually know somebody who would be more than willing to come on the show and talk to us about it. How about this? Can we just commit to do? Do you feel comfortable committing to do it? We will have a polyamory hard shot. Okay. We'll do a polyamory hard shot and we will bring someone on the show. When it will come out, though. Right. No, it, it, it may be a couple weeks. Yeah. It, it will so act. go ahead and yeah. subscribe to the Patreon. Yeah. Good time. Good time. Go ahead and do it, and uh, we'll have one out soonish. Yeah. Anyway, sure. so, um, but it's, it's interesting. One place I've struggled internally, and, and, and this goes back to our, our previous show on Hannah Arendt. 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 Whatever. Um, but Don't this goes back to our previous show. When I look, 
if I take even a cursory study of philosophy and philosophers, um, yeah, we're going to get to the beer very soon. Um, if I take a cursory study of philosophy and philosophers, um, it's the people who dispense with social norms, broke the, the mold, and just went their own way and were bold about it. And I found myself really torn where I want to be that person and I lack the courage. You know, just to be honest. Mm. And and in certain ways, I've played with the edge of it, but I haven't been able to just break that mold. Um, one other aspect. I would argue that you haven't broken that mold in other aspects. However, simply being highly involved in the Libertarian Party has broken a certain mold. Yeah. And you can argue that it's more socially acceptable now. It is. It However... Is. Um, uh, this is taking a slight tangent. Um, we've seen the argument on numerous occasions that um, that uh, the Libertarian Party is largely consistent of white males who are well off. Um, not not the case so much anymore, really. Not so much the case anymore. Are, are you but, the exception? But the argument is that um, white males have more standing in society and can break away from the mold more easily. I think there's truth to that. So, there absolutely is truth so, to so that. So here's the, the real thing we've seen in our polling. This is honest numbers. We are fairly well evening out among females. Where we are starting to even out, but we are not even close to, is among uh, uh, diversity in in, uh, in uh, ethnic. other races and yeah. socio. So we've actually seen we're still whites. We're just not white males anymore. <laughs> so, well, and we've actually seen some stratification. Is that still true, or is there is there a significant minority? Well, we've in what in the Libertarian Party. Um, we are seeing a huge growth in minorities. Which I know is when amazing. I went to the state convention with y'all a couple of years ago. It was it was a white convention. It, yeah, well, it and it, it still is. It still is. Largely. We, we are seeing huge growth. Uh, um, now, we're talking about by percentage. Yeah. Yeah. Huge percentage growth in our minority groups, but we're still way behind. We're still way behind. Yeah, I mean, yeah. you know, nothing else to say about that. Well, um, I used to be a member of the Republican Party, so I understand that completely. Yeah. <laughs> um, where, it, where it's all white men. Yeah. And Kathy Glass's friends. Uh, so... <laughs> There's one more thing I want to talk did about. Did I say that out loud? Yeah, you did. I'm, I'm you sorry. Did. So there's Fucking one more thing holes. I want to talk about with, with society. And then our plan was to go into religion, but we can do beer then go into the religious part Please. of it. Yeah. So the one, the one other cultural societal aspect I want to talk about this is the prolificness of disease and the theory that when we went from small hunter-gatherer societies into more densely populated societies, it became evolutionarily advantageous to be monogamous to prevent disease spread. Now, this is actually an interesting one because it may be true, and we don't have the scientific research to back this, that that's flipped. Because while if you're monogamous, you're only with one partner, rates of infidelity are high, and monogamous couples are much... What are you doing? Just... No, you cannot have my beer. Go away. Oh. Um, monogamous couples are much more likely to avoid both use of contraception as well as Absolutely. testing for STIs. Yeah. Whereas polygamous couples... STDs. Co okay. <laughs> anyway, whereas polygamous couples are much more likely to use condoms and testing... And so they know they're fucking other people. And so that might have actually flipped. Fuck is an STI. It's a sexually, sexually transmitted, transmitted infection. infection. Okay. It doesn't just limit okay. to diseases. It could be bacteria okay. or whatever. Well, I didn't know what the fuck you were yeah. talking about. So, okay. But yeah. Like chlamydia and yeast infections would fall under STI. See, I had to put them in STDs, but okay. I don't know what the fuck I'm talking about. I'm a history yeah. teacher. Diseases aren't. Uh, easily curable. History teacher. I understand, but, and I'm explaining to you. Yeah, thank you, I appreciate it. But, but that. anyway, biology because, learner. Well, but our audience is like, like you know. No, yeah. I know, I know, I know. STD is what they're familiar with, I think. I, it is. But because, or or, or VD, right? V, VD, VD. Yeah, but because the, the clap. But because the polygamous. 
<laughs> because the polygamists are more willing to use modern techniques, that that whole dynamic may have flipped. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think that's true, and that's that's fascinating to me. Uh, that that maybe maybe polygamy is safer than monogamy. Yeah. Uh, I don't think that's true. I, and I, I have no scientific reason for that, except I just don't think it's true. Well, well here, here's... I, I think that actual monogamy is safer. Actual monogamy, yes. yes. However, yeah, yeah, yeah. theoretical monogamy is yeah, not. Yeah, yeah. And, and, and we Perceived have, monogamy. We have a lot of theoretical monogamy in this world. Yes. And, uh, you know, I don't judge anybody, so whatever. Um, beer hey, time. I gotta Hashtag take, judge not want not. I have got to drink this, our judge's beer or I'm going to not have any beer left to talk about because we're in bad shape. Anna, Why do I have to go first? I because go you first. have the least. Fuck that. I want to go first. Go ahead. Okay, let Mike go um, first. I hate what are we first. drinking? We, we are, are drinking Kentucky Breakfast Stout by the Founders Brewing Company in a place. In a uh, place. In uh, Grand Rapids, Michigan. And this, this is a 9.2. Is an 11.8% ABV uh, good beer. Good God. This is a, a seasonal release um, rated number 36 out of all of the beers yeah. on Beer Advocate. I got to tell you, John, I really wish you hadn't have told us the Beer Advocate ahead of time because I'm feeling like it's influenced me, okay? Um, because I'm rating this very, very high. And I That's hope because it's, you're inebriated. I hope it's not because I, I heard the beer advocate rating. Okay, I hope it's not. I don't think it is. Um, the beer is it's it's full flavored. It's got some coffee flavor in there that I don't I don't know where it comes from, but I like the coffee flavor. It's got a little bit of a vanilla cream overtone in there. Yeah. Uh, that I really really like. It fills the mouth well. I love the thickness of it. Um, the smell of it's full. I can't hit this beer on any aspect, really. There's nothing in here that I would change if I was making the beer. Um, so, you know, if you've got a beer that you can't find anything wrong with, you have a really hard time coming up with a good rating. And I'm going to give it a, an extremely high rating, uh, much higher than, than probably any beer I've given in a long, long time. I'm going to go with a 4.6 on this beer. Okay. 4.6. Okay. I really love this beer. Go ahead. So, uh, as we talked about at the beginning of the show, we had three 12 ounce bottles that we split evenly between the three of us. And I am so glad we don't have a producer here today because I we really want another share. beer. And that's disappointing. No. And I kind of want to take this. We'd, I'd have said, fuck him. I have about, what is that, two ounces of beer left? Yeah, I think yeah. it's an ounce and a half, but anyway. And I really just, I, I have. Thoroughly enjoyed this beer. And I, I wish that I could take this in just like a, a tall shot glass and just stick my tongue in it. Just leave my tongue in there. Go ahead. It go ahead. So go ahead. Good. We're on video. Go ahead. People would love that. <laughs> I'm not doing that. That would turn so many people on. But I would love to just like lay my tongue in there. What you're and saying let is you'd like to practice it. polygamy with this beer. <laughs> Polyandry. Thank you'd you. like to make love to this beer. Um, Fuck but yes. But it's really good. Um, you kind of swirl it around, and you see this this beautiful chocolate slash caramel color. Chocolate. That's um, a good 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 thing. I didn't I didn't bring out in there. The so, if you were here at the beginning of the show, I know it's been kind of long, um, but if you were here at the beginning of the show, you'll remember that I noted that it had a. Coffee and brandy smell yeah, to it. Yeah. This was before I had tasted it at all. Now, uh, this is a bourbon barrel aged stout. That is so good. Um, a, stouts are my favorite type of beer. Mine too. Period. Um, taking a stout and then aging it in a bourbon barrel is like uh, taking exactly what I want for Christmas. And letting a god fuck it. Mm -hmm. Uh, and <laughs> and wrapping it in glitter and high end no, makeup. I like my my description. I, I was gonna go with a feminist version, like taking exactly what you want for Christmas and eating out while you give it to you. <laughs> Actually, yeah, that, yeah. Um, so so anyway, it, it is it is very much like that. It is taking my favorite kind of beer, um, which is exactly what I wanted for Christmas, and. 
mixing it with the only thing that could make it better, which is a little bit of oral. Uh, yeah, or a it, lot of oral. Um, if a little bit of oral is good, a lot of oral is better. That is also true. I really, really like this beer. And I, I'm a little worried because I don't even like rating a beer this high. I, I was in the same place. But this, I think, no, I can unequivocally say this is my favorite beer that we have ever had on the show. And it gets a 4.7. 4.7? Four, two, two, two four seven. So, so I'm you in a weird a place. 4.6, four, six, I'm sorry. I'm in a weird place because I can't knock this beer. And I'm going to come over both y'all. You're going to come what? over both of us? So, so I apologize for that sound in your ears. So I feel bad now that I didn't go with a five. <laughs> you know? I almost went with a four point eight, and I just—I did too. It, it I, hurts. I was so close, but I said it I can't hurts. go four eight. There's no room for growth. Like I want to just put all of this in my mouth and drink it, but I also we don't want it later. to be gone. We should talk yeah. later. Can I have the rest of that? Will you put all of it in your mouth? <laughs> <laughs> if it means I can have it, then yeah. <laughs> So, if your husband wasn't here, we'd talk. Oh I am giving it a 4.8. 4.8. Okay. Good, good. I'm okay. giving it a 4.8. You know, I was so close to a 4.8. I was so close to doing that. So, I, what we're saying is my rating was right. I sat here and debated for a while on whether I was going to give it a 5.0. Yeah. I've given one of those out. I was about to give another one out. Here's, I don't know that I've ever given one. You, no, I'm the only one that's given one. Yeah. Here's where it missed. It had great mouthfeel. It had great taste. It it had that bourbon barrel edge, but not too much. It was perfect. It was awesome until, until. Until what? You wait long enough. There is a strong bitter taste that there is lingers a bitter taste afterwards. on the palate yeah, yeah. and is undesirable. What was your 5-0? I don't find it to be a bad... Loser of cause. Yeah. I tell you what. I don't find it to be a bad... On our New Year's show... We need to put this against Lizard of Cause. But if we can get it, we can't. It's so hard to get. You know what? We both. have both. We have till New Year's. Surely we can get Fine. it. We'll try. We'll try. We'll give it a because shot. Because I think if we put the two side by side, I it think might you'll change like this things. better. Yeah. So anyway, that's the only thing I can hit it on. There's a lingering, long, there's a lingering aftertaste God, that, that becomes yeah. that becomes undesirable. But here's the here's the good thing. It keeps me wanting to drink more, and it's a pleasant experience every time it works. And we're out of beer. Mm -hmm. Speak for yourself. Um, I'll I'll take yours. You can put it on your mouth. (laughs) (laughs) If it gets me that beer, yes. (laughs) So anyway, so anyway, I was so close to a five. I'm giving a four point eight on the aftertaste. It's got a little too much bitters. Um. But it's a it's an excellent beer. Never pass this up. And it's the thing is, it's easier to get Lizard of Cause. If you come across this and you have the choice between this and Lizard of Cause, get this. Get this only because it's so much harder to get. Yeah, yeah. So that's my rating, four point. Why don't they make more of this? It is so good. They make it seasonally once a year. Yeah. Fuck them. Make more. Founders make more. We like this beer. Yeah. I'll pay for it. Replace the all day IPA. Yes, because it, it wasn't that Just good. take it and throw it away and put this in its place. I wonder if it would be, if it would be as good if it was I made all the time. I would drink it for breakfast. Yeah, I would too. I would lunch in and place dinner. of breakfast. And lunch and dinner. Yeah. Yes. I would be a lush if this was available all the time. Yeah. I'm just saying, all the time, I would be a lush. Yeah. So, what was this? An average of four seven. Yeah. So yeah, yeah. So it's one of our highest ranking. Yeah. Maybe our highest ranking. I'm not sure. Uh, it's it's up there for yeah, sure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, try this beer if you can get it. Try this beer. It's yeah. absolutely outstanding. I really do. John, are we moving less. into uh, uh, the religious arguments now? We are. Go ahead. I want to talk a little bit about this. The historian in me wanted to come out here because. Uh, Anytime we have a topic, I look at the at the religious and historical aspects, and I want to talk a little bit about where polygamy and monogamy has been in in different uh, world religions. And let's talk a little bit about Hinduism first. Uh, Hinduism, of course, big on the subcontinent, uh, India, Pakistan, uh, all of that south southeast Asia, southwest Asia. I'm sorry. I gotta sit and think about it a little bit. Do I? Do I my understand. Compass. This is an eleven point five yeah. after a nine point five earlier. In the Vedic tradition, now if you don't know what the Vedas are, the Vedas are the the 
uh, sacraments of 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 the the uh, Hindu religion, and they're largely history books. Yeah. In the you Vedic know, tradition, I used to study the Ayurveda. Did you? Yeah. yeah. Uh, I remember reading the Rig Veda when I was younger. Uh, in the Vedic tradition, yeah, a Hindu months. man could have more than one wife. Uh, it was perfectly acceptable to have more than one wife, provided that uh, that that one of his wives was of equal caste. Uh, the other wives had to be of lower caste. Now, if you know about the Hindu mm-hmm. system, they have a they have a caste system where you've got the uh, uh, you know you got the Brahmins and the Kshatriyas, mm-hmm. and below that you got the uh, uh, the you, you know the Untouchables and all these right. different groups there. So, so I, I find that to be really interesting because um, a few months ago, I actually um, I got the book on Audible, The Ethical Slut. I am so wanting to get that book. You've talked about it about three weeks in a row now. I really like it. Uh, um, that, that, that and Holy Shit are the two books that I need. I have that one, and I can't wait You've to read it. You've got to read Holy Shit. It is phenom- by, I'm going to suggest that now. I love Buy the book books. Holy Shit. It's about a uh, history of profanity throughout history. I it's phenomenal. fucking love profanity. Yeah, it's a great book. Um, they so, talk about profanity in like ancient Rome and ancient Judaism and stuff. It's phenomenal. So I actually thought that The Ethical Slut was a philosophy book about uh, the morality and ethics of promiscuity. My drink is broken, by the way. It, no, it's empty. That's broken. Which is basically the same. Broken. Um, so it, it's interesting that you say this because one of the things that the ethical slut talks about is primary versus secondary and tertiary relationships. Yep, yep. Which, though, it doesn't actually talk about having relationships in different uh, caste systems. Um, it does put sort of a... There is a relationship, and and it does not make it explicit that you can't have a different structure in your relationships, but it does talk about having a primary relationship, having secondary, and then having tertiary relationships. Yeah, uh, and that's exactly what the, they're talking about here is the fact that uh, that you can have w- more than one wife, but one of them must be of an equal caste to you, while the others can be can be lesser wives. Mm-hmm. You've got to have one wife whose purpose is to be uh, to, to be be the the chief wife, yeah. and her purpose is to take care of all the religious duties. Be the person duties. by your side. She's the religious duties. Yeah. She's the one that you show the public. The rest are your fuck buddies, basically. Let, let me ask this, and and you, I'm probably asking you to repeat something you already discussed, but I, I snuck out to the bathroom. You didn't um, have to say that. We were covering for you pretty well. Yeah, I we appreciate were. it, but now i got to explain why I'm asking you to repeat yourself. <laughs> um, you mentioned primary, yeah. secondary, and, and tertiary, I'm, yeah. But what is a third versus a second? I understand well, the primary yeah, idea. Well, okay. In, in the Hindu caste system, there is the Brahmins, which is the priestly class. And below that, you have the Kshatriyas, which is the warrior class. And below that, you have you know, the common people and then the untouchables. So the idea here is that you can have as many wives as you want. But one of them has to be in your class. So if you're a Brahmin, if you're a holy man, you've got to have another wife that comes from that class. She's your chief wife, and she runs the uh, the, the uh, uh, religious duties. And then below that, as each class comes out, your wives would fall in the cla- class that they belong in. So you know your your warrior class wives would be above your untouchable wives. I mean, I I still don't understand. You have your main squeeze. Yeah, I'm going to yeah. put this in modern terms. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You have your main squeeze. You have your side chicks. Yeah. And then? Well, again, again, you've got this situation where you have the one wife that runs your religious duties, and she runs your household, okay? Whenever you're done with her, you go to your next wife, and your next wife might be of the warrior class, the, the, the second class, and she is the next in charge. She's the assistant manager at Burger King, Okay. Uh, when you get through with that, you have the guy that the guy that's the fry cook. Each one of these has a different level. So it's still it's so 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 I guess what I was envisioning and what I was wrong about is it's not talking about your wife, your side chicks, and your friends. No, it's still a version of people you're fucking. It's still got your caste system. Yeah, it's still got your caste. Now they're all your wives. Yes. they're all your wives. But each at each level, you report to another one. Yeah. So I actually I heard a story. I, I'm going to share this. Um, and and I've actually asked one of my poly uh, polygamous friends about this. 
And they didn't know because they were in a situation where they had a wife for over a year. Yeah. And in a matter of a week went from one to three. Really? But um, the story I heard was this guy gets gets married to his first wife. He, he's, he's polygamous from day one. Nobody's in, in, in the dark on this. He gets married to his first wife, and it's great. He loves his wife. She loves him all, all as well. He gets married to his second wife, and it's hell. Because the wives are always They're bickering. arguing. Yeah. And he has to come in and be like the referee. Yeah. And he hates it. But he decides for some reason to go forward. And this is actually based on a real person. This isn't like a parable. This is like a, a story of a person. Somebody you know? Somebody who is known by somebody I know. Okay. So third level. He gets his third wife. And everything stops. Because no matter which one, and I'm going to use the term gets out of line, not, not the... the, the um, whichever one causes the issue. Yeah, whichever one is, is wrong. The other two correct the issue before it gets to him. Yep. And so everything kind of bounced out, and it's good from there on. And I can kind of see that. And I can also kind of see in a culture where you decide to adopt the structure... Why you wouldn't just say, look, she's in charge. Yeah. I got time for this. She's in charge. And, you know, while that may be problematic for the f- once you're five deep, in the early stages, that could be helpful. Like, look, her. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Does that make sense? I, I, I think so. I think so. Where, where somebody has to be in charge. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Let's talk about Buddhism a little bit, because Buddhism is actually an outgrowth of Hinduism, uh, in the same way that Christianity and Islam are, are an outgrowth of Judaism, mm-hmm. okay? Uh, Buddhism comes out with, with, with Siddhartha Gautama that comes out, and he's the great Buddha, and he, he, he changes the, 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 uh, the religion of Hinduism. Uh, in Buddhism, what's interesting to me is marriage is not a sacrament. Marriage does not belong to the church. Marriage is purely a secular affair. So there is no restriction on polygamy because the church doesn't give a shit what you do. Here, here. They, the church says, do what you want to. Your marriage is a secular affair, and it's a contract between you and whoever. And whatever you decide is fine. What Let, do you think about that? I think that in the hard shot... We need to talk about the difference in a marriage license, a marriage certificate, and contractual relationship. I yeah. think we need to talk about in the hard shot. So go to Six Pack Philosophy or patreon.com slash Six Pack Philosophy and get on board. So you well, can we gotta hear get that. that out tonight? No, no, we're not getting out tonight. Yeah, yeah. But this, eventually, because we, we're not ready for it right now. Yeah, this episode comes out three weeks from now, and I need to talk to some people. Um, hopefully, we'll have it out by the time this episode goes out. Hopefully, that, that's what I'm thinking. If pushing not, for. it'll be out. Eventually, look for it and go ahead and uh, go on to sixpackphilosophy.com and uh, uh, patreon.com slash sixpackphilosophy. Patreon.com. I don't know what the fuck it is. Yeah. Patreon.com slash sixpackphilosophy and, and sign up for us. Yeah. So the idea here is that, that, that there's no restriction on polygamy, it's, it's strictly a secular affair. Uh, the best example of this is Tibet. Mm-hmm. Tibet is a largely Buddhistic country and it's also the, lo- the largest polyandric society in the world today. Polyandric. So the wives have multiple husbands? Well, well, well everybody, anybody can. Uh, so polyamorous. polyamorous. Or, no, no, sorry. Is it polyamorous or polygamy? I, There's a difference. You know, the word I found when I looked it up was polyandric, but what they meant was men and women could both have multiple. So Multiple? Spouses. Spouses or lovers? Spouses. Spouses. Okay, yeah. so polyamorous. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, this is so sorry, hard to get a grip on. Polygamous. So yeah, hard there's to get terms, a grip on. There's terms here. Um, what's interesting about this is that that most most forms of polyandry at this time were fraternal polyandry, which means that it's usually brothers that share a wife, but sometimes it's fathers and sons. Uh, so in this case, it comes out to the fact that that women women tend to marry in Tibet either brothers or fathers and sons. And the idea is it's, 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 it's roughly the same bloodline. Yeah. And, and, and we, need to produce, we need to produce more of this bloodline. What do you think about that idea? 
You know, one thing that kind of stuck out to me, and it's, it's not the main question you asked, but you, you, you were talking about how there's a family and then these wives around them. When I was talking to one of my polyamorous friends ab- about this, actually, in a conversation that had nothing to do with the show, yeah. I was just kind of asking questions. Uh, it was a man with three wives, and I asked him, because I'm a, a, I'm a monogamous individual, I said... I, I gotta ask about the sleeping arrangement. Do y'all all pile in a huge bed or whatever? I'm just saying, I like snuggling, and I can only imagine. I fucking hate to snuggle. Really, I, I love snuggling. Do you really? I'm a snuggler. Yeah, yeah I'm one of Our those guys. Our heater's not great in the winter, no, so see, see, once I'm done, that. <laughs> once I'm done, I go to my side of the bed. Leave me the fuck alone. I want to sleep. Yeah. I do that too to sleep. But I take some snuggling time every night. Do I yeah. not? Yeah. Now I tell you, I like snuggling on the couch. Whenever middle afternoon, when I'm, it's time, time, it's time to watch some, watch a good movie or something. Yeah. I'll snuggle up and go to sleep. But it, when it's time to I'm go to bed, get the fuck away from me. Get the fuck away from me. It's yes. time to go to sleep. Snuggling and banging are two different things. Yeah, anyway, yeah. all that said, <laughs> so I asked him, "Do you and your three wives pile up in a bed together? You know how does that work?" And and his answer was that each of the wives has a separate bedroom and he floats. He goes to a different bedroom. And and you know what sounds amazing to me there? Floating from bedroom to bedroom? Having my own bed. So you'd be okay with two that. Two out of three nights. You'd be okay with that if John just, just left you alone two two nights a week? I, I'm just saying. Hey, John. John's going on a business trip this week. John. And it means that I have the bed to myself for five days. You want to move me into one of the rooms, you and me? And we can that we can have like one. We can move Joe out. He can have his own house. Every heaven. couple of nights a week, you and I can cuddle and we can give Anna a little bit of a break. Absolutely. Yes. Any chance I can cuddle with Anna? Hey, this is not that kind of relationship, God Mike. damn it. That's very, very masochistic. As long yeah. as it's only for a few minutes and then you get the fuck out, that's fine. But I just want this king size bed to myself. But it was interesting. Y'all have a king size bed? Yeah. I've just got a queen. Yeah. I feel so, so, so demasculated. You now. should. You should. All I right. can do cartwheels in my but, bed. But the point is, they each had their own bedroom, and he said it gave them creative space. It gave them their own space. And really, in some respect, I kind of felt bad for him. Yep. Now, a bunch of people are going to look at me like, what do you mean? <laughs> but they each had their own space. They had their own individuality. And he kind of became the common tool. Amalgamous. Yeah. And and he floated between them. Now he he got some amount of choice. They didn't, yeah. right? Um, but it it was interesting to me the way they divided that and what rights each side had on the whole thing. I want to talk a little bit about something we're a little more familiar with. Uh, I'm going to skip the Celtic a little bit. Yeah. Uh, the Celtic idea was we know the Celtics in Ireland and Scotland and parts of the Britain Islands. Practiced a little bit of polygamy mm-hmm. before uh, before the Christian tradition was was dropped there, but we don't know a lot about it because they didn't have a written tradition. Okay, right. so I'm going to go. I right. tried to do a research paper on Celtic society once, and it was a bitch. Yeah, they had no written tradition at all, it so it's all bitch. oral. Uh, so I want to talk about Judaism because honestly, uh, Judaism is very close to us. Mm-hmm. Judeo Christianity. I mean, the fact that we put the and two it's words very together. Well written. It's very well written. Uh, uh, the Torah, which is Roughly the Old Testament. Bible, okay? yeah. Roughly it's the Old Testament. It's not exactly, but but if you're a Christian, it's roughly the Old Testament. The Torah regulates polygamy very, very heavily. In fact, so much so that in the uh, uh, in the Ten Commandments, adultery is the only one that's dealt with twice. Okay, If you read the Ten Commandments, they deal with it once in the action of adultery and another time in just thinking about it. Okay, mm-hmm. yeah. It's a crime to, to have sex with, with your neighbor's wife, and it's a crime to look at your neighbor's wife. Okay, uh, so, so it's something that, 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 that's very, Sounds very Sounds like something that they were really having to fight hard because it was a natural... Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's something that, that, that that's bizarre. And we think of, of polygamy as something that is anathema to Judaism and Christianity. But if you're dealing with Judaism, you're really dealing with Christianity too. Yeah. yeah. Because the, the, the books of the Torah are accepted in, in, in the Old Testament of Christianity. Uh, Exodus verse or Exodus 21.10 says that if a man takes another wife for himself... He, his food or clothing and his duty up to the marriage shall not be diminished. So the idea here is it's okay to take another wife 
so long as you treat them equally. This is biblical in the Bible. It says it is okay to have another wife so long as you treat them equally. The the guy I talked to is actually a very, he would call himself more fundamentalist than probably our listeners, Christian. And he believes his, his polygamy is based in Christianity. And he believes the idea of monogamy is a European tradition invented and inserted into the Bible. I, I, I think there's, there's some degree of truth to that as you look at this, because there's a lot of examples of this. Um, uh, Deuteronomy 21, 15 to 17 says in there that a man, uh, uh, when, when you're dealing with the inheritance of a child, the inheritance has to go to the firstborn son, whether or not the first firstborn son is the is the is child the first wife? is the child of your favorite wife. Even if you hate the first wife, the firstborn child has to inherit everything. Can we go back just a second? Because you yep. hit on something interesting. I was talking about societal and, and and cultural reasons for this. One thing that I meant to hit on that we didn't is property rights. Yeah, yeah. Because we at the point that we had the Neolithic Revolution. And we started to accumulate and pass on wealth. It became, one theory is, it became important for us to have strong lines in which that wealth moves. That's right. That's right. And it becomes essential that there be rules on who inherits the, the wealth. Yeah, and That's what not, primogeniture is about. Primogeniture. Please explain that. Primogeniture is the, the, the medieval belief Primo meaning mm, first, and first gesture means generation. generation yeah. It's the belief that the firstborn child should inherit everything. And the reason they came up with primogeniture was because before that, because your, easy. Well, your sons would, you know, you, when you died, your sons would, would go to war against yeah. each other to see who would inherit everything. Primogeniture settled of all of that. Primogeniture settled all that. The eldest son inherits everything. The others fuck you. Yeah. Well, that's kind of that goes back to Deuteronomy. The idea that the firstborn son inherits your property, even if you hate your second wife, even if you you have you're despised by him, your firstborn son inherits everything. That's what the prodigal son is is talking about when they talk about this stuff. Is it interesting? Because we have this idea now of memes, and I'm not talking about the images with the little words on them. I'm talking about cultural ideas. Where cultural ideas can now evolve faster than genetic ones. And we have these societal norms that grow out of things where even before memes became, thousands of years before memes became a thing, we decided that property was more important than genetics. Yeah, yeah. Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. The idea was right here that we have to protect our property above all. Yeah. And we needed rules for it. And the fact is that monogamy allows uh, a, a degree of protection of those rules. Yeah. Well, and at the time, you could prove property. You could not prove genetics. You know what I found interesting is that even in this time period when, when, when they're talking about this, uh, there were restrictions on polygamy. Deuteronomy 17.17 17 states that the king shall not have too many wives. What they mean by this is the king can have multiple wives, but he can only have as many wives as he can take care of equally. So if David has 100 wives, just throwing a random name out there. If David has 100 wives and he's sitting on his rooftop and he looks across and he sees a naked Bathsheba, woman bathing, yeah. Bathsheba, Bathsheba. Uh, he's not supposed to take that on. I'm just random names. Well, sorry. You know what? But but if he took her on as a wife and treated her equally, it would be okay. So because the idea is you have to treat all your wives the same. So as long as, like, you know, 101 Dalmatians. I wonder, can, can you treat them all equally shitty? You know, here's the yes. problem. Here's the problem. You can beat them all with a rod as thick as your thumb, but no thicker. Yeah, yeah. That's where the rule of thumb comes from. Yes. Yeah, yeah. Um, here's the problem with treating them equally. And, and I'm going to get real in a level that most of our listeners, most people aren't willing to. When you talk about your favorite kid. Yeah. Most people aren't willing to answer that question. I understand the reason why. I have a favorite. Yeah. I also <laughs> right. only have one, though. <laughs> right. 
the truth I'm of the not matter, answering that question. The truth of the matter is, and I, tell me if I'm, tr- I, I'm going to ask you as a philosopher, tell me if I'm lying here. Your favorite kid is different from moment to moment. Is yeah, that true? I think so, yeah. And the reason you're Whichever not, one pisses you off at the time falls to the back end. Yeah. The reason you're not willing to write it down, the reason you're not willing to record your favorite kid Which is, is exactly why people change their wheels. Yeah. Is because maybe next week your favorite kid changes. You love all your kids, but you do have a favorite in any given moment, but you're not willing to record that because it's not necessarily your favorite next hey, week. Yeah. Let me ask you something. I know I'm older than y'all and all, but if your son pisses you off, can I inherit everything? No. It's going to the party. Fuck. It, really? Hey, the kid ain't even getting it. <laughs> like, it's not even like competition. The, the, the yes, kid, it is. The kid's out of the question? No. Well, so, so to me, so to me, and we haven't even talked about this. <laughs> oh, for fuck's sake. Here we go. Whether or not that I was kind of joking about the party. Get I was, yeah, was yeah. kind of joking about the party. Yeah. I'm kind of of the belief that you give more to your kid if they know they're not getting shit. So I'm kind of of the opinion of don't give them shit regardless. Maybe it goes to the party, maybe it goes to the city, maybe it goes here I'm or there. I'm just saying, I hope that I don't die suddenly. I want to know that death is coming so that I can spend every last dime that I have. I want you to know that if you die suddenly, I got your kid. Sugar Jay and I are friends. I have, Sugar Jay and I are tight. I don't know that I trust that. Now, he and I are going to go out and no, party together, no, but but I no, got to, I, I'm no, going to take care of your no. kid if you die suddenly. I will stay alive at least until he's 16. I'll stab <laughs> you too, John. Can I have your hand? Can I kiss it? Your I'm godfather. Sorry, you guys. Uh, I'll stab everybody. You right. are the godfather. If, I'm you know what? Everyone. I got to tell you, the last godfather I became came. I ended up moving in with me, so I'm a little concerned about that. Yeah. All right. Let's talk about the Levitic tradition. Uh, in ancient Judaism, the Levitic tradition uh, w- was this idea of of the Jewish law and 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 what you're going to do. And under the Levitic tradition, a man was required by law to marry and support his deceased brother's widow. So if your brother dies, you are required to marry your brother's widow and take care of her and her family. Genetic uh, argument kind of yeah, thing. Yeah. yeah. And it's, it's it's back to that idea of this is still my 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 genetics. Yeah. What do y'all think about that idea? I think it it makes sense. Uh, I think it's culturally foreign, but I understand it. Yeah. So Would well, you do it? It it was a no. m- it was a moral argument that it was it, it was immoral to allow them to starve on the street. I gotta say, but it, I it was equivalent to taking on his cattle. I wouldn't marry, but if. I've got four sisters. Would, I don't have any brothers. You would but let if any them of my come sis- and live at your house. But if any of my yeah, sisters died, yeah. they would be in my house immediately. Yeah. But, but, but and if, that's all that that was. But I don't want to be boxed. Here's my thing. I don't want to be boxed into marrying. And, and I had one sibling. She died at the age of 10. So it was well before any of this. But I don't want to be boxed into marrying my sibling's uh, 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 spouse. spouse. But you take Over care of this. Them. I would take care of their kids. Absolutely. No yeah, questions yeah. asked. What if your sibling died and the spouse need to take care of? Say again. I sir. think it would What if your sibling on... died and their spouse needed taken care of? Would you would you yeah, let them absolutely. move in with you? Absolutely. And and, it, and I'll even say this. I have a close ring of friends who if in if any of them died, I'd take care of their kids. Like it's not even just, just genetics. I would take care of their kids. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but I would I not relate to that. I but would yeah, not that's, tie myself to their spouse. Yeah. yeah. That's more of a uh, communal protection than it is uh, marriage specifically, but I think yeah. that's what this was. I gotta yeah. tell this you this was you. an outlined this was a um, Defined by a higher being, protection of the community. I got to tell you, um, John. I don't think that these marriages were all about reproducing. It was about protecting the community. John, if you were to pass away tomorrow, I would let Anna and Sugar Jay move in with me. I understand. Anna, if you were to pass away tomorrow, John would be on his own. I'd, I'd let Sugar Jay move in with me. So here's the thing. So l- let me I say this before you say that. I will stay alive at least until John is 16. <laughs> you're, you're worried about that? I am. I'm a good dad. Taking him to the strip club at 12. I didn't do it to my own son. You think I'd do that with yours? Well, you yes, I would. Exactly. Let me, let me yes, say this, Mike. Yeah. Mike, if you die... I will tell Thomas what to do for the rest of his life. <laughs> Thank you. I appreciate it. As a godfather. If he, you want to he's an me, adult now, so it's it okay. It doesn't matter. I will still tell him. All right. 
let, let's move into yeah. into Judaism a little bit. Yeah, let's, uh, let's Maimonides. Maimonides was a very famous rabbi. Yeah. Uh, and, and he came out and he interpreted the Torah a little different. He read the same documents, but he interpreted it to say uh, uh, that, that, that it's okay to take more than one wife, but he said you can't make the wife live in the same courtyard as the previous wife. You like have the, to give her her own house. I like this house. evolution. You have to give her own household. Because I like this. you have to treat them all equally. Yeah. Uh, and I, I, I kind of like the idea of that. Look, God damn it, you can have as many wives as you want, but you have to treat them as the same. Can, can I say something slightly personal? Slightly. Okay. okay. So, so we were up late last night talking about this show, actually. And the whole, like, pool of the conversation was that the, the, the most desirable part of this whole, this whole philosophy was that Anna would have someone to braid her hair. Okay. <laughs> Legit, though. So, so two days ago, I decided that I wanted to braid my hair. And, and if you have long hair and you've ever attempted to braid it, I was, I was French braiding one, and, and I was doing it, and I got to the back of my head, and I was to the point of doing the tail. And I came around to the side of my head, and the problem that you experience is that it twists. Yeah. And it looks like shit. Yeah. And a, a, a totally out, actually outside of this show, I was like, man, you know what would be nice? Is if there was like a chick... Who lived with us? Who <laughs> just like when I woke up in the morning, we would be getting ready to go about our days, and I could be like, "Hey, will you braid my hair?" You know, and she would braid my hair, and know, I just want somebody to braid my hair. I gotta be honest. I gotta be honest. Since since my goddaughter moved in with me a year ago, uh, she's You've seventeen years braid? old now. I am an awesome braider now. <laughs> will you braid my hair? Yes, yes. If you want me to, I'm an awesome braider I just now. Just want somebody to braid uh, my hair. What I find interesting about the, all this is, uh, in the modern era, polygamy uh, is almost non-existent in rabbinical Judaism. Yeah. That they don't allow it anymore. Right. Uh, and, and in fact, so much so that in the state of Israel, it's illegal. Mm -hmm. What I find interesting, and this goes back to something you, you brought up earlier, is while it's illegal in the state of Israel. They don't enforce it on the Bedouin societies that are still around there. And the reason why is because the Bedouin societies are nomadic societies. Uh, and, yeah. and, and, and they're still in a situation where, honestly, uh, the men are outnumbering the women. Yeah. It's a little different situation. So it's a, it, it's a little bit bizarre system. Uh, let's talk about Christianity a little bit because as, as Judaism becomes Christianity, we have the New Testament introduced into this. And the New Testament puts all kinds of, of, of restrictions on this. For instance, in Matthew 19, uh, they say the father and mother shall cleave to his wife and they shall be as one flesh. Mm -hmm. this, is, this is where the whole concept of monogamy in Christianity comes from, that you shall cleave as one flesh, that you shall not be, uh, be part of anything else. I understand what you're saying. I don't understand why three people can cleave as one flesh, or four people, or five. Like, I don't understand the philosophical argument for why two people must be one flesh and not five. You yeah, know, yeah, whatever yeah. it is. But, but again, they specifically say husband and wife shall cleave as one flesh. Yeah. So they specifically have two. Why can you say husband and wife and wife and but husband they don't. and wife and wife? You, you know, can or say that all you want to, but they don't say that. Yeah. They say husband and wife, yeah. singular. Yeah. If they said husband and wives, I think would you would you Or argue? husbands and wives? Yeah, but they don't. So so that this is the argument where it comes from. Now, uh, interestingly enough to me that, that this hasn't always been interpreted that way. During the Protestant Reformation, uh, which started in 1519 with mm -hmm. Martin Luther, to the 1500s, fairly modernly, right. honestly, yeah. Martin Luther, who, uh, who led the Protestant Reformation in Germany, uh, the Holy Roman Emperor, Empire at the time, uh, goes through, and he actually gives a dispensation to Landgrave Philip of Hash that he can have a second wife. And the reason he gives this is is basically that uh, that Philip needs a second wife. Mm -hmm. You know, he goes through and says, uh, Philip Philip has has too much going on. Yeah. One wife can't control it, so I'm going to give you a dispensation outside of this. Yeah. Sounds allows good. It. Yeah. 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 That, that's my argument, too. Um, is that is that a duck penis? I'm not. I'm not really. 
So this is the tool with which I will disembowel. It does you. look like a duck penis. <laughs> Either that or maybe. This. Is that really what a duck penis looks like? Not exactly, but close. Close enough. Yeah. Close Ish. enough. Uh, I had a buddy of mine in high school that we used to call Captain Hook because his penis was shaped a little bit like a hook. How did you know? Uh, because he showed it to everybody. Oh. Yeah, he was he was very very proud of it. Um, <laughs> he should uh, not have done that. Well, you know, uh, I'm not going to say his actual name, but Captain Hook was notorious. The women loved him because it hooked in the right direction. Well, good for them. Uh, depending on your position. Yeah, I think if you went in the wrong position, it yeah. wouldn't be good at all. Yeah. Uh, but uh, anyway, Captain Hook was was amazing. Okay. Was he? Was I had he a, amazing? I had another buddy of mine that was named Meat in the Marine Corps who had a... Massive. There is a lot of homoerotic shit going on in the he, Marine Corps. He had a massive tool, and he would he would show it off every chance he got. We'd be at a party, and he'd put like 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 banana stickers on the side side of it, and walk around with it. And we'd be like, "Hey, meet your cock is sticking down." He'd go, "I know." <laughs> he didn't care. He didn't care. Okay. He, he was advertising. I just want to share that with you. Thank you. There I'm is a lot sure. of homoerotic well, stuff going there on. There is so much. As far as I know, nobody was fucking him, but, you know, uh, whatever. Uh, I can imagine they were afraid to. <laughs> I would have been. I would have been. Yeah. Because that monster was, was like like a leg. So, hey, uh, something it that... It was impressive, though, I got to say. Can we just move on? I no. was very impressed by it. No, on, on that same video that we talked about with, with the gay guy... That's not a video. Guy, that's really... No, the gay guy who had the column. Huh? The gay guy who had the column about sex... Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. yeah, yeah. yeah. Dan Savage. Yeah, not Dan Savage. Column. <laughs> Wrong column. We were on the wrong column. Yeah. But uh, on that, um, he was talking about how a surprisingly high number of, of homosexual men don't take anal. I was, as a straight guy, I was like, I thought that was all they did. I thought yeah, that you was would it. expect yeah, it would shocked. be like 50%. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. I, I was surprised too. I was really yeah. surprised. Uh, because you know, as a straight man, I don't take anal. So. Yeah, well, but I, I'm expecting like, well, I'm a straight man. Did gay men just gay men you know, must yeah, do yeah. this? Yeah, yeah. yeah. But all right, I'm just saying I know about the same percent of straight men who take anal as that article said that gay men take anal. Really? Oh well, there you go. I don't know those guys, or if yeah. I do, I'm not aware of it. How's that? They are secret. They I know secret. lots of guys who take anal. I'm just saying. So you've had a lot of experience with this. Oh. I. And part of the Libertarian Party that is very <laughs> sexually open. All right. And I'm so, just saying, I hear lots of stories. Lord help me. I saw videos. Let's talk about the Roman Catholic <laughs> Church. You church see again. videos. I just hear stories. I'm impressive. The Roman Catholic Church uh, goes through. And honestly, it struggled for a long time with the idea of, of, of polyamory. Yeah. Uh, there was In the early Roman Catholic Church, there was a great deal of it. Because if you look at it... There's a lot of the uh, the patriarchs that had multiple wives, mm -hmm. and you've got to justify that. So St. Augustine comes about, and St. Augustine comes through and justifies this. Um, he says that the reason the patriarchs had many wives was not because of fornication, but because of the need to have more children. Uh and, and the fact that they needed more children because of the population problem yeah. meant that it was necessary for men to have more wives. So I didn't know. That's actually... the same question to me, but okay. Yeah. I think that makes sense, though. If, if you've got a pop, if you have a shortage of population, then, then men should have sex with as many women as they could. I, I disagree, actually. I think if you have a shortage of population, because he's talking about many wives, so many women committed to one man. I think if you have a shortage of population, you should have all the men fucking all the women. Which is exactly yeah. it. Everybody but, should be fucking everyone. But no, one guy has six wives, so that means six people devoted to one man. Yeah. But what it should be is throw the women in a metaphorical pile. A, a mosh pit. A, yeah. A, just a fucking mosh pit. And just go to town. Would you stop following me around in the 80s, yeah. goddammit? But uh, you know what I'm saying. Yeah, I do. I do. Yeah. I, mean, I do. I do. Uh, that yes. th doesn't seem to be the way that men think. Yeah. yeah, because individual instances of sex do not, by and large, especially in these times when the understanding of uh, the reproductive cycle of women was not well understood, 
so many instances of sexual intercourse did not end up rela- resulting in pregnancy. I'm just saying, if you have a number of women and you have one sitting around without a cock in her, she is not it's doing her waste. part. She's not doing yeah. her That's job. That's a waste yeah. is what God I hear. Damn it. I, I do. You were at that party. Yeah. I, I want to point out really quickly, uh, last week we did an episode on Hannah Arendt, and she actually did her doc- a doctoral thesis on love in St. Augustine. Um, so if you want to learn a little bit more about marriage and love during this time period that yep. we're talking about right here, check out her thesis. Okay. I want to talk about the Church of Latter-day Saints, the Mormon Church, uh, because that's really the most modern idea of, of polygamy. Uh, I had a crush on a Mormon for like a week. I'm sorry. And then it was over. Uh, Joseph, it was the sexy underwear, wasn't it? I, re- yeah, it I learned about the underwear and was like, nope, I'm done. Sorry, guys. There goes my chances. I have very sexy underwear. I wore zebra stripes. Was it long johns? No, I wore zebra striped G-strings. Oh, nice. It's I nice. don't know we'll why talk. you... We'll talk. Let's go with the show. We've been getting it's really freaking distracted. Sexy. All right. So the Latter-day Saints uh, is formed by Joseph Smith, who believes that, uh, that, that, that that he walked into a cave and found these, these, uh, these tablets uh, that were written in an ancient language, and they, they gave him... Were they platonic? They gave him the lost gospel of Jesus Christ. Shut up. Uh, so Joseph Smith comes up with the idea of, uh, of plural marriage, is what he called it, uh, and the idea that men should have as many wives as they can so long as they can take care of them equally. Mm-hmm. Uh, he starts off in Illinois at a place called Novo. Uh, uh, he practices... The, the, this plural marriage. Eventually, the people of Illinois are going to rise up against him. Uh, he's going to be killed in the, in, in, uh, uh, for, for his transgressions, and the Mormons are going to be forced to leave. Brigham Young is going to lead them out. Um, to Utah. To, through Utah. Utah. And in 1852, as, as, early, or as late as 1852, Brigham Young uh, talks about the idea of plural marriage uh, in a sermon. Mm-hmm. Now, what I find interesting, and I couldn't find, I couldn't find where they found this in scripture. I've looked for it, but I had a buddy of mine that was a Mormon a few years ago that I asked about it. I said, "Where does this idea of of plural marriage comes from?" And he told me that his understanding. Now, this is from a Mormon. His understanding of it was that the well of souls they talk about in the Old Testament was a limited number of souls, and when the well of souls was emptied, that Jesus would return. So it was the responsibility of men to have as many wives as to possible try to empty the well and as have as, as much possible. sex as possible to have kids in order to have as many kids as possible. Wouldn't to this go back to the this, mosh pit? Empty yeah. this soul out. Uh, Theoretically. So, so that was his that was his his understanding of it. Now, do I know that that's true? I don't. That was the understanding that I had explained to me. And the answer is no. It doesn't go to the mosh pit because that Why would not? have put men and women on the same playing field. We'll talk about that in a second. Yeah. Uh, but but that was in 1852. In 1860, the U.S. Congress passed a law that said that polygamy was illegal in all U.S. territories. Boo! Yeah, yeah. So so what are we going to do? We're going to push our way all the way into Utah. We're going to establish our own kingdom outside of the U.S. government. Uh, eventually, that's going to be going to be sucked in. By and, R, you mean Mormons? I mean, yeah, you're yeah, not yeah, a Mormon, yeah, yeah, yeah. but you and, know. and and right. the Mormons are eventually going to sue in the Supreme Court for their right to polygamy. They're going to sue, and their argument. Under the First Amendment, their argument is that that they they have have a have a right to uh, associate, the mm-hmm. right to association. Yes. Uh, in the case of Reynolds versus Sims, the Supreme Court is going to going to disagree with them, and they're going to say that polygamy is illegal under the U.S. Constitution. Boo. That was in 1878. Um, uh, what is that called? Activist judges. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And but but the thing is, it was effective. Because yeah. by 1890, the the leader of of, of the uh, of the LDS Church, President, who was it, uh, Charles Wilford? Wilford Woodruff, Wil- Wilford Woodruff comes up and says that uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, that plural Getting marriage done. that plural marriage is illegal. Now, what he doesn't wait do, a minute. He doesn't outlaw people that are already married, but no. he outlaws all future p- plural marriage. Um, so this, this continues for, 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 for quite a while. Now, we know that in 2005, the Salt Lake Tribune says that there were as many as 37,000 fundamentalists living in the United States in plural marriages. 37,000 
mm-hmm. plural marriage families. There were as many as 37,000 fundamental, fundamentalists with less than I'm half sorry, less of than them half of them living so, in polygamous So you're looking at you're looking at, at, at still you're looking at 15,000. 15, yeah. Uh, that's pretty significant. That's a lot. Pretty significant. So uh, that Hashtag that's fight the power. That's here in the United States. Uh, let's talk about Islam a little bit because we hear about Islam all the time and how they have they allow so many marriages. Uh, not really true. Right. Not really true. Most of your modern Islamic faiths do not allow plural marriages. Uh, in some fundamentalist Islamic faiths, people are allowed to have up to four wives, but they must treat them equally. So, they, so that, they, that, that seems the, to be the underlying religious current is treating all of your wives equally, yeah, yeah, except yeah. in Hinduism. Yeah. Well, and, and it's interesting to me. It, it kind of speaks to... I'm not a Christian, so I'm not buying into any of this shit. Right. But it kind of speaks to me of what my friend told me about monogamy being a European injection into this because I keep hearing in these Christian or Judaic based religions, yeah, Judeo Christian, yep, that the fundamentalist, yep, believe in in some form polygamy. polygamy, yeah, yeah, yeah. yep, yep, yep. But 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 there's there's something that's changed as, yeah. as it's gone through. Yeah. Uh, interestingly enough, the founder of Islam, Muhammad, he actually you, know, you hear this all the time. Muhammad had all these wives. Muhammad was actually monogamously married for the first uh, twenty five years of his wife uh, life. Excuse me. <laughs> first uh, for the first, first twenty five years, years of his wife. wife. His his wife died, uh, and he ended up marrying nine more wives. Throughout the rest of his life, at different times, right? He was never married to nine at a time, uh, but 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 he spent twenty five years married to one woman, mm-hmm. uh, and, and and to me that that chain that's a little different than saying he married all these women. Yeah, serial polygamous. Yeah, or yeah. sorry, serial, serial mo- monogamous. Monogamous. Yeah. Uh, uh, so interestingly enough, there are some Muslim countries that still allow polygamy. Uh, Malaysia, Morocco, were two examples of it, but in both of these cases. You are required to have the permission of your first wife uh, or of all of your wives before you can marry another one. I but, can appreciate that. But doesn't that make some kind of sense on – because when we talk about cheating, I think largely we're not talking about having sex with more people. We're talking about a a damage or about breaking deception. of trust. Yeah. And if they say, if she's cool, you're cool, whatever, doesn't that kind of speak at I some... I think it makes sense. You know, yeah. I think it makes sense. Uh, you know, l- leave it up to people to make their own damn minds up. Yeah. 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 All right. So, John, I have covered the uh, religious You've arguments. Covered all the religious arguments. I've, I've tried. I've tried. You know me. I'm, I'm, I, I, you're I, right. I'm pretty complete in this stuff. You want to talk about female liberation? I got four questions. These are going to be quick round robins and we, yep. we can close out. Three of them are listed. Okay. One I saved. So so first one, I, I want to go round robin. I guess we'll start with Mike, Anna, me, then Anna, me, Mike, and then me. Whatever. We'll go through. And the last one, we're going back to you. Okay. How does female, because I think we can all agree, female liberation has changed and yeah, yeah. much more modern. How does female liberation affect the argument of polygamy versus monogamy. I think it changes things to the fact that uh, that in traditional polygamy, the man has all the power. And I think in a modern tradition, females are not willing to say, fuck you, uh, uh, you, you know, uh, the men are, are in charge. They're, they they want to say, uh, we have a say in this. And in modern polygamy, women have, uh, have to agree to it. Anna? I think as we... Evolve to a more egalitarian state. I love that word. I do too. What we end up seeing is that um, polygamy and polyamory are much more accepted uh, throughout all societies, um, and and that monogamy becomes much more about a contractual relationship regarding uh, the collection of physical and monetary goods than it is about sexual relationships. I th- and, and I think that is due di- directly to, uh, well, 
I was going to say, I, I would say that's directly to female liberation, but I think female liberation runs side by side with male liberation. Yeah. I, I think that as women have not been traded as property, men have... Not been expected uh, to trade. Have become less expected to be the uh, providers and protectors of women and have been been liberated from that responsibility themselves as well. And it, it is not just people with vaginas who have been liberated, but it's everybody. Well, I agree with that. And I think if... if Screw the people with vaginas. If... I know that's exactly what you want to do. Yes, that's yes. why I said it. But uh, I think at some point, bad. men were expected to <coughs> own a part as much as females. Now, you can argue which part was worse and which part was better. Mm -hmm. But there may be some guy that wants to get punished every night on Thursdays when he has his date. And he was expected to be head of the household, right? Yeah. And maybe that's not a role he wanted to play. So I agree with you on your, your liberation part. As, as to an answer to the question, does female liberation change these arguments? Uh, I, I think absolutely it does. And I think it comes to uh, consensuality. Uh, we'll address this more in question three. But I think it comes more to when you're on an equal footing, you get to have an equal conversation mm -hmm. in the relationship. And there's only one real unequal footing these days in the conversation. And that is when the government tries to tell you what conversation you can and can't have. Yeah. So question two, starting with Anna. How does the lowering reproduction rate change these arguments? Mm, fucking is about more than fun than uh, more about fun than babies. And I think it has a significant impact on how it is that we structure our relationships. And again, I think it actually tends less toward monogamy and more toward consensual, open, honest relationships um, in which you can uh, reach contractual agreements with regard to physical property and money um, but that when reproduction is off the table or at least is uh, limited significantly that it kind of frees everything up there yeah well and I think the lowering reproductive rates are somewhat correlated with higher resources per individual so I think that probably plays into it I mean if we look at the 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 arguments for the growing brain and the human brain being larger, uh, we can also see that people are more able to provide for uh, their their children. Well, uh, and I think that lower reproductive rates aren't so much the question as much as lower mortality, infant mortality rates and uh, and maternal yeah, mortality rates are, yeah. are the issue there. I think they're, they, they both... Play there, in. There's a correlation among connected, all of yeah. it. However, um, I don't think it is strictly due to a lower reproductive rate, um, but it's also to but, do with. But mortality. I also want to say I don't necessarily think this plays this plays completely into it because I think there's more to the question than just sex. I think we're looking from a very shallow view when we look at sex, and I think a lot of people when they look at relationships are looking for other fulfillments. Now, does that then open certain doors where you don't have to take care of kids? Absolutely. But I think to say it drives people one way or another, I think people have a tendency and it allows them to explore their own tendency without driving them one way or another. It actually liberates them to explore whatever they themselves. Yeah. Well, and, and I would make the argument that... Um I, I would ask people, I suppose, to set aside any predispositions that they have against Hillary Clinton and take Fuck her. And, and take the statement, it takes a village Fuck to her. raise a child. I know what she was trying to say there, but regardless of what she Fucking was... Fucking communist bitch. Regardless of what it was that she was trying to say, we have taken... A lot of truth in that statement um, for generations and generations um, in that it is not solely the 
responsibility of the parents to raise their children. Yes, it is. But that it is uh, society's responsibility as well. And you, no. you, Mike, have advocated for the ability to punish other people's children. I'm a piece of shit, though. I don't think that you are, but you've advocated for problem. people's ability to uh, punish other people's children, and that is exactly the application of it takes a village to raise a child. It doesn't take a village. It takes a parent. Uh, I would argue that it doesn't. Um, there are so many instances where... Uh, children don't want to emulate their parents. They don't want to listen to their parents. But it is the people that they experience in their ancillary relationships outside of their immediate family that influence them in how it is that they're going to behave over the rest of their lives. And so it is not just the impact of their parents specifically. And with that, I, me. I, I will not say that I think that Poly, uh, polygamy is necessarily the answer, but I would at least want to consider the question of whether or not having those ancillary adult relationships around them does not allow them more examples of honorable, respectable behavior. Mike, how yeah. does the lowering reproduction rates change these arguments? It doesn't. Nothing? I okay. don't think so. All right. I don't think it has any effect on it. Question number three. I'll go ahead and start with this one. How does modern property systems change these arguments? And and, and I think this is actually a really interesting one because we talked earlier about how um, a large part of the the uh, atomic family was about passing property on. And we have the modern invention of the will. I can actually say, and I... I, I, I I'm going to use the word joked, but I'm kind of not really. <laughs> I joked earlier about the kid didn't get anything because I think he needs to, to... Earn it himself. Yeah, earn it himself. Yeah. And and I was more joking about the party. No, it's not completely ruled out. Um, but the point is I have the ability. The bigger point is I have the ability to direct my resources wherever I want. Yep. I can put it to the firstborn. I can put it to the thirdborn. I can put it away from all of them. And so I think... I'm that, giving it to the library. Yeah. Oh, that's a good idea. Exactly. And so I think that kind of breaks one of the big arguments for this system, which is property rights, in that we now have the ability and, and de facto rules in order to do this that don't require a, a, a single family structure. Um, and so I, I think this, again, liberates the idea of whatever people want to do. Mike? I agree with you. I think that uh, that in the modern society, we don't need these property restrictions anymore. You can do what you want with your money. Okay. Yeah, I agree. Yeah. Well, and and I would lean toward that I, I think that monogamy is probably easier in the society that we deal with. We talked about... Uh, the rates of violations of the monogamous agreement. Um, and, and so maybe I'm wrong there, but I, I do think that monogamy is probably considered to be the easier thing to commit to because you do have to have certain conversations when it comes to uh, polygamy and polyamory um, that maybe people would find to be difficult or cumbersome. Um, but I think that differences in the way that we manage property will at least free people up to make the decision about what method it is that they want to employ when it comes to putting their uh, reproductive organs against other people's reproductive organs. All right. Mike, this is the last the one. We're going to start with that. you. This is a three-parter. What is your opinion on polygamy uh, versus monogamy. Yep. What do you think is best for society, and what laws do you think society should make around that? Okay, I think that uh, uh, that monogamy is healthier than polygamy. I think it's probably a better system for most people. Uh, that having been said, I don't think any laws should be placed there. I think it should be something that's left up to individuals. Uh, I would like to see more monogamous people. 
but I would not like to see the government making you be be, be more monogamous. What was the other part that I missed? No, that was it. That, uh, what do you think about them? What do you think is best for society, and what laws yeah. do you think okay. should be enacted? Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Anna? No laws. Um, as far as what I think is best for society, I think what's best for society is for people to be honest. I think for some people, that means being honest that what you want is a monogamous relationship. I think for other people, it means being honest that what you want is a polygamous or a polyamorous relationship. Um, and having the fortitude to both have that honest conversation with your partner and potentially end a relationship with the partner that you've chosen at the time because your desires don't match up or you're not willing to make your desires, uh, find a compromise between your desires. Um, so I, I think the thing that is healthiest for society is not about how many people that you bring into your uh, sexual and emotional relationships but is more about being honest about it. Uh, what was the first question? I kind of took those backwards. I think you got what's, them all. Yeah, what's your views on uh, polygamy versus monogamy? What's best for society and what laws to be enacted? I think you, I think you hit them all. Yeah, yeah. I, I think what my view is on it is it really depends on the... I, I want to say the individual, but I guess what I mean is the... Independent the couple, the specific relationships yeah. between individuals depends on the relationship. Yeah. yeah. Okay. I, I'm gonna I'm gonna ask for a little help here because I've forgotten the term. What's the window we were talking about earlier? Overton, Overton window. The Overton window. I think so. My polygamy versus monogamy view. I think our Overton window is highly shifted toward monogamy mm -hmm. right now. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. And I think it's moving. Yeah. I, I think it is. I think not it by is. Not much though. No, it, well, it, it, it never does. No. It's a slow moving it's a slow window. Move. That's the usually whole point. it tends to have it tends to have it tends to jump at times. Yeah, but yeah. So uh, I think right now it's highly weighted to monogamy. But I think there are a bunch of misnomers that monogamous people are happier or healthier, and I think the science largely shows that's not the case. I think what it shows is that people who are in relationships they don't want to be in are not happy, are not healthy, but people who are in mutually agreed relationships, whatever that structure is, tend to be equally happy, healthy, and, and, and you know, satisfied with their life. Um, as far as what's best for society, um, I think it's best for society to dispel with the idea that there's one answer to society generally across philosophy. We have seven billion and some change people on this earth and the idea and they should all agree with me that we should have one answer for all of them agree with me is the stupidest thing ever yeah stupidest and, thing and, ever. and as far as laws go you know I, i'm not gonna say there should be no laws around this i think there should be laws but i think the purpose of all those laws should be protect to be to protect people against forms of coercion Fuck and force into into relationships. Mm -hmm. You shouldn't be coerced into a relationship. But besides protecting people from that, it's not their business. I agree. Well, and I think we already have laws against fraud and coercion. I do. And so laws regarding fraud and coercion specific to uh, sexual and property-based relationships I don't think are necessary. Well, well and... and I disagree somewhat. I, I think there's some unique situations that can arise there. Okay. However, however, the point is that we do have a lot of laws around this, and we need to roll back to those. Okay. So I'll that, give that's, you that. That's where I'm. This was a lot of fun. It yeah. was a lot of fun, and there was so much information here. It and was a lot deeper than I thought it was going to be. I thought this was going to be an easy show, and the more I right? researched, the less it was easy. Well, and and maybe it should have been into two shows. Nah, I enjoyed it. it. Maybe it. we could have done with a you couldn't hold on for this strong screw beer. You. Yeah, yeah, so a slightly less screw strong you with beer, a duck dick. Except I really like this beer, a, a corkscrew dick. What so a great beer! It was a very good beer. So anyway. We want to say this beer. thank you so much for tuning in. We've enjoyed it, and we hope you have too. We'll see you next week, guys. Cheers. 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 
Six Pack Philosophy is supported by independent philosophers just like you. If you would like to support us, go to sixpackphilosophy.com and don't forget to like, share, and subscribe.